CMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help. We'll go ahead and begin. It is 7.34 p.m. on Tuesday, September 24th, 2024. Good evening. My name is Christian Klein, and I am the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals, and I'm calling this meeting of the board to order. I would like to confirm that all members and anticipated officials are present. So members of the Zoning Board of Appeals, uh, Roger DuPont. Here. Uh, Patrick Hanlon. Yes. Venket Holly. Yes. Uh, Daniel Riccadelli. Yes. Adam LeBlanc. Here. Thank you all. And um, Elaine Hoffman uh, notified me that she has a conflict this evening and is unable to attend. Uh, so then moving on, uh, officials from the town, we have Colleen Ralston, our zoning assistant. Here. Good to have you with us. And uh, we have Michael Champa, the director of inspectional services. Here. Good to have you with us. Uh, then appearing for docket 38. 13928 Massachusetts Avenue. Uh, Susie Sanchez and Kiernan Matthews. Here. And here. Thank you very much. Uh, appearing for docket 3814 200 Broadway. Uh, Kristen Germano and Ricardo Rulo. Did not see them in the waiting room. I just wonder if they. Okay. Um, and then appearing for docket 3817 15 Janet Road. Uh, Mary O'Connor, I believe, representing the homeowners. Correct. Here. Great. Good to have you with us as well. Thank you. So tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely, consistent with the supplemental budget bill signed by Governor Healy on March 29th, 2023, which extended temporary provisions pertaining to the open meeting law to March 31st, 2025. The extension of these provisions allows public bodies to hold its meetings remotely by providing live, adequate, alternative means of public access to the deliberations. This meeting is being recorded and it will be broadcast by ACMI. Members of the public who are participating by Zoom and who wish to offer public comment should be aware that they will be asked to provide their full name and address so that a complete public record of the meeting can be taken in accordance with state law. All participants of this meeting are advised that people may be listening to the meeting without offering public comment, and those people are not required to identify themselves. Any votes that are taken this evening will be conducted by a roll call. All supporting materials that have been provided to members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. And as chair, I reserve the right to take items out of order in the interest of promoting an orderly meeting. As the board will be taking up new business at this meeting, as chair, I make the following land acknowledgement. Whereas the Zoning Board of Appeals for the Town of Arlington, Massachusetts, discusses and arbitrates the use of land in Arlington, formerly known as monotomy, an Algonquin word meaning swift waters, the board hereby acknowledges that the town of Arlington is located on the ancestral lands of the Massachusetts tribe, the tribe of indigenous peoples from whom the colony, province, and commonwealth have taken their names. We pay our respects to the ancestral bloodline of the Massachusetts tribe and their descendants who inhabit historic Massachusetts territories today. So just a brief notice on procedures. At the end of the discussion of each individual hearing, the board will vote to either continue the public hearing to a specific date to continue receiving testimony on the matter, or the board will vote to close the public hearing, ending the receipt of new testimony. The board will then proceed to the next item on the agenda. Over the coming days, the board will prepare a draft decision based on the testimony received and the discussions that took place during the public hearing, and that decision will be voted on at the next available meeting of the board. So with that, uh, the first eight items on our agenda are the administrative items. And as chair, I will move the discussion and voting on administrative items to the end of tonight's meeting uh, so we can proceed directly with the public hearings. Uh, so with that, we will be moving to item nine on our agenda this evening, which is the continuation of the hearing uh, for docket number 3814-200 Broadway. Um, I'm asking if Kristen Germano or Ricardo Rulo from DLM Holdings have come on to the meeting. So at the prior hearing, the board had um, had heard this case 
and the applicants had requested a continuance so they could confer with their um, with the client and they were trying to determine if they wish the board to continue to a decision or if they wanted to withdraw their application. Um, so at this time, I do not see any representation uh, from the applicant. So um, the question I would ask of the board is, does the board wish to further continue or should the board move to a decision? Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Having heard nothing from the applicants, apparently, and I think that was confirmed by Colleen Rolston, um, I think that I would go along with the idea of closing the meeting. I think that that would be appropriate under the circumstances. Okay. That would be my inclination as well. And then the, the chair will accept a, um, so we had discussed at the, at, at the end of the last meeting. Um, so if I could ask Mr. Hanlon to prepare a written decision um, supporting a denial of the special permit request for 200 Broadway. Mr. Chairman, I'm happy to do that. Great, thank you. Uh, so with that, um, the chair will accept a motion to close the public hearing for docket 3814 of 200 Broadway. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. So roll call vote of the board with a yes, no response. Uh, Mr. DuPont. Yes. Mr. Hanlon. Yes. Mr. Riccardelli. Yes. And the chair votes yes. Uh, Mr. Holly was not present at the first session, and Mr. LeBlanc is uh, recused on this hearing, and Ms. Hoffman not being present. So by a, a vote of uh, four to none, we move uh, to close that hearing. So that brings us to the next item on our agenda, which is docket 3817, 15 Janet Road. Um, so I could, if I could ask... Um, Ms. O'Connor to introduce herself and um, tell us what her uh, what her client is looking to do. Uh, yes, good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the board. I represent the homeowners of 15 Janet Road and they have applied and they are on uh, the call. Carrie and Chobit, um, you can see them. Um, Daniel St. Clair is the architect on this project and they've requested relief in the form of a variance to build an addition to their home and a special permit. Um, I can... Uh, either address legally the basis for the variance or have Mr. St. Clair review the plans first. Which order would you like? Um, if Mr. St. Clair would, could go ahead and uh, walk us through the plans. And uh, um, Ms. Ralston, if you could go ahead and give him permission to do so. Okay. Be all set. Thank you. Mr. St. Clair. How are you? Good. So are, are you looking for me to, to step you through the plans? I don't have yes, them please. loaded. Uh, I talked to Colleen and I thought she yep. had said that you, you would do that, but I, I can. I am happy to do so. Okay, I, I can do it if it, it'll just take me a minute. <clears throat> Zoning approval set. It's probably best to start with the site plan just to kind of get a sense of um, the configuration of the site, which is um, uh, kind of a, a major uh, impact to um, what makes doing what would otherwise be a pretty simple as of right addition um, not so here. So you can see the um, so this is a single family house. Uh, Carrie and Chobit have lived there with their family for some time, and it's their plan to live there further. This is not a, um, you know, build or flip or anything like that. Um, so uh, 
you can see the house is situated on a parcel that's uh, 6,001 square feet. Minimum lot size is 6,000. Um, the uh, house is a uh, pretty typical center uh, hall colonial, garrison colonial. Um, it's, um, uh, we're looking to do an addition that would best accommodate the, the needs of the family as they grow and their two kids get older. And, and Carrie also has some uh, um, mobility issues. And so getting the, uh, the washer and dryer out of the basement and, and making a more livable situation um, was one of the goals and also having a garage um, where they could pull the car in and, and get in and out of the car without having to deal with you know, rain and snow as, as an element, it would definitely help their lifestyle um, because of that condition. Um, and so uh, the, as you can see by the shape of the site, the house is really kind of just jammed into the only place, the existing house, the only place where it could fit and not um, be a, um, in violation of the, the side yard or the front yard or the rear yard. Um, the long um, angle going um, left up to the upper right of that apex corner is the right hand setback. Um, and so um, the, the only logical place to put an addition to accommodate uh, the program of a um, garage and kind of entry mudroom type of space on the lower level um, and uh, to facilitate, you know, getting somebody in and, you know, doing the, the, the things in life that you need to do with getting groceries out of the car, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then having uh, another room upstairs for their uh, family as their kids get older and, and uh, Shelbet works from home. And so, uh, you know, the need for extra space there. Um, the only real place to do that is uh, in the footprint area where to the right of the house, as you view it in this image, where the driveway is. Um, and so why don't we uh, go forward uh, on a couple of uh, other drawings. Um, so this, this is the survey, I believe. And then on the architectural drawings, we have uh, the survey uh, and uh, the all the existing conditions. So uh, the, this is the house in its existing condition. So roof plan, second floor plan. These are the elevations, front and rear. The two side elevations, left and right. And building sections. And you can see there is a uh, lower level, which by definition is a cellar and doesn't count as a story or uh, against the square footage here. And that's confirmed on the survey. And then this is the, um, the site plan using the baseline survey information showing the addition to the right. Thank you for zooming in. You can see the, the new garage, um, a covered, uh, entry porch kind of between the garage and the, the existing house with a walkthrough space that also can serve as a mudroom and connect to the rear yard. Uh, you've got to shift the garage forward to have it um, not uh, be at the uh, property line and, and you come away with a four foot setback because of the uh, really the hardship that's created due to the shape of this site. We're also proposing a new covered entry over the existing front stoop, we're just putting a, an unenclosed covered entry over that so that you can get in and out of the front door without getting soaked in the rain. That is the subject of the special permit. The addition is the subject of the zoning um, variance. And if you uh, go to the architectural plans, <clears throat> so this shows the basement on the right. Um, the uh, and these plans are flipped from the site plan. So sorry for the confusion there. So the the road uh, is on the on the bottom of the page here, if you will. Um, and so you can see here the um, one car garage with a couple stairs up to deal with the transition and grade. 
into a mud room, which is really just a connector and collector of circulation. And then you come um, into the living room and into the kitchen uh, in a direct shot from there. And on the floor above that. <clears throat> That's the floor below, right? So the, I'm sorry, this is, yes, this is the basement. Um, so it just shows the existing basement where we plan to put in a, um, a, a new built-in shower and do some minor modifications to the layout down there, uh, reusing the existing stair. And you can see the dotting showing the outline of the, of the new um, two-story uh, addition with the garage and the entry on the lower level on the left. And if you go to the next page, <clears throat> on, on this page here, this, uh, this image here is the second floor plan. We're reconfiguring the, the back hallway just a bit to go through that existing bedroom and give you access over to the primary bedroom, um, putting the new laundry upstairs to accommodate the practicalities of, of living, and um, but also uh, uh, addressing Carrie's need of, uh, for not carrying laundry up and down stairs and Shobit's need for doing that as well. And, um, and then there's a hall bathroom um, that has a, um, a new tub in it that makes it uh, more workable for their two teenage kids. Um, so um, pretty, pretty straightforward layout. Um, on the left, uh, on this page, you'll just see the roof plan. <clears throat> so just the, you know, architecturally trying to keep with the same um, open gable ends, same kind of seven to 12 pitch roof um, and, you know, acknowledge the entry spaces with uh, open porches and, you know, human scale column elements, um, both at the new covered porch and um, uh, to, at the addition and the new covered porch at the main entry. You can see it's the roof there of the new covered porch at the main entry at the bottom center. Okay. If you go to the next pages, you'll, you can see the elevations. So this is the rear elevation um, showing the, the back of the uh, garage and uh, primary bedroom on the right, the addition. Um, uh, go to the next, go down, go down yeah. Uh, this is the, the view from the street. Um, and you can see the main house still has its kind of primary materiality of the brick on the lower level with the um, painted siding above and the addition is kind of subservient to that, if you will, architecturally and as you know, the, the painted siding, the one car garage, um, and above the, the uh, primary uh, bedroom. And you can see the covered porch over the existing uh, stoop at the existing front door. <clears throat> and the next sheet will show you side elevations. So the image here is the side elevation of the, of the addition on, the, on the, uh, the left hand side of the house, if you will, facing it from the street. And as you scroll down, um, you know, the other side of the house, which you really don't see much of the addition, but you see it peeking out on the, on the upper left there. And in both of those, you see the, the one story roof uh, over the uh, front entry. And these are just uh, building sections showing how the addition on the left uh, will be a slab on grade, oh, excuse me, and um, uh, up against the uh, edge of the, uh, probably with a crawl space up against the uh, full excavation of the, of the basement. And the bottom is just a longitudinal section through the addition. Perfect. <laughs> Right, and that's the end. All right, well, thank you for walking us through that. Appreciate that. Yeah, I appreciate um, your help. <laughs> no worries. Um, so I had a couple of quick questions. Um, on the application itself, um, it is listed that the house is an existing three-story, so I just wanted to confirm that it's not, that it's actually two. Correct, and uh, I debated that uh, a bit, and... So the survey and our surveyor um, calls it a three-story house, 
um, not because that was uh, how zoning treats it by the bylaws um, in the Arlington bylaws, but because it was it, there is a basement. He and I talked about it a little bit, and we felt like it might not be um, might be misleading if we say it was a two story house. So we That's left it at three. And so the application was consistent with the um, with the uh, survey because there's a lot of very useful uh, zoning information on the survey. I left that at three there, but from a purely through the zoning definition, it's a two story house. The attic and the lower level do not count as stories by the zoning. And it looks running the numbers that the proposed addition is is less than fifty percent of the area of the existing house because the garage doesn't count towards gross floor area. Um, and I believe right. that's correct. Yeah. Cause otherwise it would need a special permit for a large addition, but it does not because it does not meet that requirement. That is true. And something we talked about with staff and uh, clarified that in our applications. Um, and then there was a, a we had um, a comment letter from uh, the senior planner. I wasn't sure if you had seen that it had been posted to the website. No, we uh, did not see that. Okay. When was that posted, Christian? Um, so essentially, just to, to paraphrase, um, they had taken a look at the application in regards to the town's residential design guidelines, um, and they had. Um, some concerns in regards to um, to one of those principles, uh, which discourages prominent garage doors, specifically in front of the primary face of the house, um, and encourages uh, detailing on the front facing attached garage doors so they don't appear as a just sort of a blank surface. Um, so it's something I think we would like to explore with you, um, but I would like to give other members of the board an opportunity to um, to ask questions at this time. Mr. Chair. Yes, Mr. Riccadelli. If I could ask, um, I'm not sure if this is for uh, Mr. St. Clair or Ms. O'Connor, but um, so on the survey, there's that 20 foot right of way that's at the back the rear lot line. Do we know uh, what that right of way is is for? I do not. I have. We haven't done a full title, so I do not know. Do okay. you know, Dan? I have in the back of my mind that there was a. It was for utilities, but I'm not sure of that. And I believe it's off the property. Yeah, it's it's it is like the uh, the abutting uh, back line looks like that right of way so uh but just looking from you know it's hard to see from the street but looking from google earth there's sheds and things on top of it so just wondering if you knew the use of that space yeah it looks like it's in this area here but it obviously doesn't continue through it seems to terminate at some point down here but it's <laughs> the, the town's gis service does not list the easement mr chairman Yes, Mr. DuPont. So I had a follow up on that too. I was just trying to make um, sense of what I saw in the plan and then what I saw in the in the uh, actual property. Is the fence the uh, is that the line of the right of way, and that the right of way then is beyond the fence? Is that how that's set up? I was just curious about that. Daniel, do you know the answer to that? Um, you know, I believe that the uh, survey does not indicate a fence. Um, and my recollection being out there um, is, is in, um, Carrie and Chobot, am I correct in my recollection that the, there isn't a fence there now? Um, so I'm sorry, where are you? Are you talking about the back of the property? 
Yeah. yeah. And I apologize because I was looking at a photo online and there was a bright white fence. It looked pretty new. Yep. Yes. Yes. So uh, about two months ago, less than that, our neighbors moved in to the uh, house. They put a fence. Yeah. The house behind us behind put up that. a fence. Okay. So, but that fence then is essentially on your property line? It's at the edge. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, it's at the edge of the property, but what they've essentially done is they have fenced off the right of way. And I'm not sure that it's relevant for this hearing, but I was just curious about that because it could have some meaning when it comes time to consider the variance, at least from my point of view. So I, I didn't know that. And and I'm not sure, I'm not sure they're entitled to do that. <laughs> Ms. O'Connor might have an opinion well, about that. They, they, if they do it and the, the holder of the easement has to have access, they're required to immediately remove it. Yeah. So, all right. Well, uh, they've enlarged their yard by uh, 20 feet, apparently. But, <laughs> Mr. Chairman? Uh, Mr. Duke, Mr. This, uh, this is Hanlon? Mr. Yep. Um, so, <clears throat> Well, Carrie and Chauvin are still on the line. I, I was there a little bit earlier today, and it looked to me as if everybody on the other side of that easement has, I mean, it, if, if you just go out and look at it, you'd never imagine there's an easement there for a road or anything else. It looks practically like it's built all over. The houses are on it. Everything is there. I mean, yeah. the amount of mayhem that would have to happen if somebody went in and sought access to that easement is truly astonishing to contemplate. Uh, but I mean, what, what I was interested at is this: this is nowhere near those situations where somebody has a has a triangular lot because you have two streets coming together. Uh, that area has been completely taken over by the houses on the other side, and and it actually makes this a very tight lot. Would Would you agree with that? Does that make sense to you? This is to carry and show oh, to us. Um, I guess yeah. so. I mean, I never, I didn't even. We had no idea there yeah. was anything. I mean, there used to be a farm here a long time ago. So I don't know if anything to do with that, but we had no idea. Yeah, about the, 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 when we we had to have our road repaved and it's a private way. So when we were doing the research for that, we did discover that the the reason the road has sort of a strange shape is because it actually used to connect to the road next to us at one time. And then it was just kind of cut off and they built houses. Maybe it was a horse and buggy type right of way at some point. I yeah. think they used it for cows, I think. <laughs> Good old so, Arlington Paper Streets. So, Mr. Chairman, <laughs> Mr. Chairman can we take Ms. O'Connor up on uh, discussing the uh, criteria for the variance? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Chairman Klein. And uh, Mr. Hanlon, um, as you know, as the board knows, a variance is a creature of statute, uh, 40A Section 10. And I've given you a memorandum dated September 4th. Um, the first prong, there are three prongs to the test. The first prong is that uh, we need to establish that the lot um, is that owing to circumstances relating to the lot or to the structure, they are such that they are different from all the other structures um, in that zoning district. And I would say to you, you can look at that site plan that Mr. St. Clair had up. This is a triangular shaped lot. Um, it's a very unusual shaped lot. It's very distinctly different than all the other lots in the zoning district. And the way the structure is set on the lot is likewise a hardship. Uh, the second prong is that we need to establish that our literal enforcement of the bylaw would invo involve substantial hardship, financial or otherwise. And I would suggest to you that the substantial hardship is the inability to be able to uh, build an addition like most other people on that street could, um, but for the unusually shaped lot. The Also, the other hardship is that uh, uh, Kerry has some uh, significant mobility issues that require this addition. And the third prong of the, of the statutory uh, law is that desirable relief may be granted without substantially derogating uh, from the bylaw 
and, and without causing substantial detriment to the public good. And I would suggest that in any other situation, this would be a typical type addition to a home. Um, I also want to point out that um, massing wise, this structure is substantially similar to the house immediately behind it at 34 Lansdowne Street. Um, and that um, we also have submitted uh, letters from other neighbors. Uh, I think you have at least three mm -hmm. on Janet Road in support of this. Uh, and they recognize that this lot is unusual in shape and that the structure sits in such a way. So everything is to the other side. You can see how much land uh, is to the point of the triangle to the right of the drawing. Now that goes to the variance um, requirements. Um, I could go through, uh, unless you want to stop, uh, you want me to stop there and, and we'll deal with the special permit after that. Um, <clears throat> I guess we might as well go ahead and, and proceed to the special permit. Okay. This Mary, is just- Can I just uh, throw in one other thing? The, the, sure. the proposed house with the addition is also under the FAR. So it's not as if the site is being overbuilt. It's the <laughs> configuration of the site that is creating um, the request for um, the variance here. Well, the configuration of the site and the uh, location of the house on the site as well. Agreed, agreed. Um, so that's, uh, both prongs of the first prong of chapter 48, section 10. With respect to the special permit, it is very limited to covering the entryway. Uh, and I, I can go through all of the uh, required findings in section 3.33, uh, but I've set them out by memo. Would you like me to go through them um, for you? Um, if you could just touch on the uh, point F that were uh, about the um, integrity and character of the district. Um, yes, it's not going to have any impact on the integrity and character of the district. You've, uh, if you've gone up there, you've seen um, the other structures in that area. And this is such a minor uh, request here that I would suggest to you that it will not have any uh, negative impact or impair the integrity or character of this district. Great, thank you. Most of the, the findings in 3.33 do not apply here for this special permit. Yeah. Are there further questions from the board? So I did want to get back just to the, this question of the residential design guidelines. Um, so Mr. St. Clair, I don't know if you had a chance to uh, review them as a part of the um, your process when you were designing uh, this addition, um, but the the town has residential design guidelines there that, that uh, the board is allowed to um, to reference and apply in, when there's a special permit or a variance request. And essentially what it's trying to do is to um, make sure that proposals are, are in harmony with the district um, and with the what the, the town is looking for in terms of um, ad additions to the, the housing stock in town. And I, I'm just going to search here in the background for what I'm looking for. Um, And so this is a proposed front elevation. Um, so currently it's just, uh, this portion is the existing, this is the addition. Um, this end gable here is gonna be the closest to the street. Um, and it's a very uh, sort of plain blank facade uh, with basically a 12 panel door. Um, so the in the residential design guidelines, uh, A3 references sort of trying to avoid this, but if if this is uh, being if this is sort of the only situation that can be accommodated to doing something to make sure to either have it be that the garage door has uh, like a row of glass lights in it or adding a glazed transom above the garage door, um, doing or you know maybe having, you know, just a, a simple uh, hipped or shed um, uh, sort of 
you know, protrusion over the over the door so that there it's not just sort of this long flat facade with very little differentiation. Um, so just want to sort of present that to you and see if you have some thoughts about what um, what are things that could could be done um, on your end to try to sort of enliven that that facade rather than just sort of have this sort of very plain facade being the the foremost facade. So I mean, the intent was always that uh, the garage door itself be that they they purchase a you know all weather you know quality garage door that has panels and could also have glass in the panels. So that that would be my my first solution. Um, I think we we could look at a transom above, but there are no other spaces in this house that have transoms and. Mm -hmm. um, so even though that is a solution and I think it would be acceptable, it certainly would add a lot of cost and we're trying to be very cost conscious um, sure. um, with this and, and still uh, still ring the bell on all the other things that we need to do um, with respect to adding a, a roof. I mean, that would that could be an interesting feature. Again, it's a whole new architectural element whether it would be a shed roof or a little hip roof or something, we don't have those architectural elements elsewhere. And that would just further be sticking closer to the street and in the front yard setback. So uh, I was trying to avoid, you know, uh, having further projections on the face of the building because, you know, we had to shift the garage forward a little bit to deal with that back triangular corner of the site as it was. So I would lean towards putting, uh, getting a garage door that has a window in the door as a, um, as a reasonable solution that also is, uh, you know, cost effective in its execution. Thank you for that. Um, turn to the board. Um, are there just sort of what the other members of the board think about, um, this sort of gable end facade and what we what may be appropriate to request under the residential design guidelines. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. So uh, when you walk up uh, the way in which this in which the residential guidelines, the primary way in which it fits into our consideration has to do with the integrity and the character of the neighborhood. If you walk up and down this street, um, there are a lot of houses like this house is right now that the, that don't have garages, um, but a number do. They're all, many of them are right across the street from this one. Several, three of them are. Um, and they, and they differ in two principal respects. One is that, with one exception, which is painted yellow in, in the house at the far end of the street, uh, it, it's a door quite, pretty much like this. Two of them have, maybe three, have windows in them, which are the same thing that Mr. St. Clair has, has suggested. Uh, one of those is painted a dark color. It's a dark brown color rather than being a light color so that it gives a, an impression of variation rather than uh, another thing. So when you look at what is actually happening on this neighborhood, the way in which the some variety is being given to the appearance of the doors as such, is uh, is largely through the kind of mechanism that Mr. St. Clair is pointing to. Um, the other thing that's a little different is that the other houses that have garages tend to be what I and my untutored lawyers think, think of as a kind of a ranch style house. There's not a lot of house on top of the garage. So here there's a blank space between the second floor and the garage door that is empty in a way that is not characteristic of the neighborhood. And I don't really have any, the, the neighborhood itself doesn't have really an answer to that. Uh, the houses that don't have garages are often behind fences. It's not even clear to me that their addresses are on Janet Street rather than the street behind it because the two are coming together here. Um, and so I'm not sure 
whether there's anything realistic that can be done to deal with sort of the blankness of the area above the garage door. But there is a pattern in the neighborhood and Mr. St. Clair, without referring to that, has really suggested some solution along the same line that has been done uh, in the other houses that have garages. I will point out that all of them have one car garages and this also is a one car garage. That's not necessarily characteristic of Arlington, but this doesn't have the degree of dominance it would if you were trying to get two cars in there. Great. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Other comments? Was that Mr. Riccadelli? Oh, Mr. LeBlanc, excuse me. Yeah. Um, just a thought on it on this, just to maybe carry over an architectural element that is already present on the building. Is it possible to step back the lower portion of the addition where the garage is, you know, like let's say six inches so that it kind of matches the same garrison style that's going on there? Um, and then maybe you can get a, a you know a brick treatment on the, the front of it on that lower portion to kind of carry over that that element of the building. Um, and I don't you know, I don't think it'll take away too much from the garage. Um I think there'll still be plenty of usable length in there, um, but I'll defer to what Mr. St. Clair has dis discussed with uh, with the homeowners for their intention of the garage use. I uh, shall respond to that. Um, Please. Klein. Okay. Please. Thank you. It's a thoughtful comment. I appreciate it. Um, just from a architectural point of view uh you, you see these garrison um layouts where the second floor sticks out a foot above because the floor joists are going front to back and they cantilever out so it was an easy thing for the builders to build as a prototype when these this home home typology came came out and they're also on the gutter line they're but on the gutter side of the of the, the house, the overhang is not on the gable end. So we would be mixing metaphors here by putting it uh, again. It's a good idea, but you know, as I as you try to go back to having some sort of reference to why these product types were done the way they were, because the gable is turned ninety degrees in the addition um, to to break up and kind of pay reference to the larger existing house. Um, then this is the gable end, not the gutter end of the house. And so you wouldn't have the joists coming out. In fact, the joists are going left to right, not front to back. Um, so that, that, to me, that takes away the reason why you might justify the step. Um, and then um, I, I, I personally would, would like to avoid having the brick just on the front side and not have it wrap the, uh, around, again, out of kind of the architectural consistency of um, you know, these houses having a brick base and a wood top. Um, so I don't mean to say no, but that's just my reaction from maybe too, too many years of architecture school to that. But, uh, you know, it, it, you know, if, if the, if people wanted us to put a little extra trim above, uh, the door, we could do that. Um, you know, the transom would actually take up some of that space. That would be another way to do it. But again, it's introducing a whole new element and it wouldn't quite align with the things behind it. So, um, yeah, I wasn't uh, sure if the transom would pick up that, that same reference line from the top of the windows and the top of the doors, if it would sort of carry that line across or not, but. They could, but they would be really tall transoms, yeah, you know. That's a very and, good point. And yeah. so, you know, that's I mean, fair. it, you would have you would have like a three foot tall by nine foot piece of glass over your garage door. And it it, it seems to me that it is becoming such a feature that says, look at me, where, yeah. you know, what we're trying to do is have this be not the feature. This is the pants of the tuxedo. The top of the tuxedo with the cummerbund and the bow tie is that is the original house. And we're not trying to upstage that. At least that's my view architecturally yeah. of that. OK, well, thank you for that. So anything uh, else? Just, yeah, just to kind of continue on that. I guess the, the thing that I, I'm seeing with it is I think the we just need something to break down that facade a little bit more because we have so much going on in the main facade that, you know, does everything that we want to do to announce, hey, this is the 
you know, the main entry of the house and all that. But then this new addition is just kind of, you know, a, a blank flat thing. So I think we need to consider something that can help break down the scale of that additional facade. And in the same way that the existing garrison style of the house does to itself, something to help that on, on this little facade in some fashion that, that does go with the architecture, but um, does break down that facade a little bit more. I think will help bring the, bring this in line better with the design guidelines. All right, thank you for that. Anything further from the board? Uh, Mr. Chen. <clears throat> yes, Mr. Holly. Um, I was looking at the existing pictures and I may be mistaken there if the images that are available online are existing, you know, are, are current or not, but there are these exterior shutters that the existing building shows as a color on it. Is the, the first question I had was, is the new addition will also have the shutters shown or will be, will the existing shutters be deleted and also deleted or not be present in the new portion? For question one, and then if not, I, I was going back to the, you know, the um, the published document by the town on the guidelines, design guidelines, and that there is, you know, there is an indeed mention of um, windows and ordering them and aligning them with in a logical fashion. So it just quickly occurred to me that the windows that are over the garage door, you know, do not match the extents of the garage door or, you know, could that be something because it, it's they are in the bathroom in the primary bathroom and there is a opportunity there to make it more symmetric so wanted to get thoughts of the architect there as well asking whether those windows could be set closer together oh yeah or could you know could the arrangement be such a way that yeah so the the the, the the location of the, the well, the, the question about the shutters will play into whether mm. that thing will happen or not. Yeah. So, so the first, uh, I'm, I'm just looking for pictures of the house, so I have them to reference myself. But uh, the first question is, um, do we plan to do shutters or not? Um, and um, look, I my uh, view is not one that I would draw a line in the sand in. I think, you know, different people have different views about that, but the shutters are not real shutters. They're not operational. Um, you know, they tend to be an extra cost and a maintenance issue. And, and I would, I think when you're building a modern building, you know, some, you should do the, you should focus on the things that are more meaningful and not just, um, um, you know, not not really performing anything, but are just kind of providing a um, an image that uh, you you may or may not um, think is relevant in today's day and age for just a shutter that's stuck up on the the house. Now, I would note that the house today does have shutters on the front, and I think that's, in my opinion, that's up to the owners as to whether they keep the shutters on their house or not. That's not a zoning issue, right? Um, if it were my house, I probably wouldn't have them on, but they can keep them on. I would not put them on the addition. And so, um, you know, this is where I guess the subjectivity of architectural design factors into this. Um, so, um, you know, if, if the goal here is to add the shutters back in the drawing, we, we can do that if that helps people. I, I don't think that's something really that's subject to a zoning board review as to whether you have the shutters. I, I appreciate the discussion, don't get me wrong, but I would not suggest them on going on the addition. And they're, they're only on the front elevation of the main house now, not on any of the sides. So I wouldn't suggest putting them back on any of the sides, whether that's the existing sides or the new sides. Did that, did that Mr. help? Chip. Mr. Mr. Chip, just to Brown? clarify, that wasn't my intent to add them. My intent okay. was to just, I was just checking online. Like you yep. said, the existing has it, the drawings do not have it. Um, my goal or, you know, the intent was to see if the window arrangement could be logical 
enough and reduce, you know, or could play along with the proportionality of the addition was where I was getting at. Um, if the if the shutters would not be there or deleted from the old and the new, then I was seeing a flexibility in adjusting the windows in order to make it more proportional. That's all I was. It was just going back to the guidelines to see the arrangement, logical arrangement of the windows. That's all relative to the garage door and the addition. So I, I think what you're saying, correct me if I'm wrong, is bring the windows in a little bit on the second floor addition over the garage so they align with the edge of the garage. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Right. Great question. Um, what I'm trying actually to do is to keep the spacing, the punt, have punched openings with a similar amount of siding of spacing between them that already exist on the existing house. So it's more consistent. At one point, I had the two windows put together as a double window right. in an earlier version. The problem with that is there's no place in the house where that happens. And it ends up being this kind of, um, this moment where the new is not in working um, in in concert with the existing and they were they were con they, there's too much contrast and they were conflicting so uh i personally think having the windows um have the have the same amount of kind of sp spacing and uh, i don't think they need to line up with the garage in fact i think if they did line up with the edge of the garage it would really get very static um so that's my thinking behind it again um every person brings their own artistic uh, or subjective touch to this Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, the last thing I would just add, the inside layout informs where the windows go as well. So you're constantly trying to toggle between, okay, if I move this window over, is it now in the shower or, if it, or is it not centered over the, the toilet or the dressing table or something? So, you know, so you're trying to always toggle those things together and, and this seemed to be the right balance both inside and outside. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, unless there's any other questions from the board, um, it's going to move on to public comments. Uh, before opening tonight's meeting for public hearings, here are some ground rules for effective and clear conduct. Um, so opening the meeting for public comment, public questions and comments are taken as they relate to the matter at hand. It should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing its decision. Members of the public will be granted time to ask questions and make comments. Members of the public who wish to speak should digitally raise their hand using the button on the reaction tab in the Zoom application. Those calling in by phone, please dial star nine to indicate you would like to speak. You'll be called upon by the chair, asked to give your name and address for the record, and you'll be given time for your questions and comments. All questions that should be addressed through the chair Please remember to speak clearly. Um, and once all questions and comments have been addressed and allocated, uh, the public comment period will be closed. So with that, are there members of the public who wish to address this application, um, which is uh, docket number 3817, uh, 15 Janet Road. Mr. Moore, Stephen Moore. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Um, I want to uh, uh, pick attorney when Stanley O'Connor's brain a little bit um, to do with this right of way that's running behind the property that the neighbors seem to have uh, adopted um, somehow. To the extent that she can help, um, but it Mr. Chair, you're frozen. I don't know if you realize. Uh -oh. I think we lost Christian. Oh, he's definitely gone now. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Pat, you're up. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> well, well, we can uh, go Mr. Handler, can I could just ask a question? Yes, not, go ahead and ask, you ask your question. You don't need to okay, wait for Thank you. Back. Thank you, Mr. Handler. Um, yeah, this right of way that's running behind the house, this 20 foot right of way, my guess, 
I'm guessing, and I don't know if it's true that it's a, some sort of paper street or something that the town's full of. And certainly there's other private ways around this uh, this property, including the actual address. Um, in terms of the variance, building the structure that close to the property line is, is probably an issue. And what I'm wondering is, is when there's a paper street like this or a private way, a, a right of way like this, does the town maintain uh, or or does it remain right of way in perpetuity this way, generally? Well, um, hi, Steve. Uh, I I would tell you that the right of way goes nowhere. Um, it, so it may be contained in a deed. It, it probably was a right of way for passage. They said there were cows and farmland up there mm. for use for farming. Um, the town um, probably has abandoned it. Um, and I think Christian said it did not show um, on the town records. So it's not in the applicant's area on the applicant's property. It abuts it. So the building the, the house where it is, is is not an issue. Okay, so the fact that it would appear that this right of way is on the probably neighborhood neighboring properties deeds, I guess. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So there. Uh, you know what happens in something like this? Um, the title company will look at it and will see that it's probably 150 years old mm -hmm. and it's been built around and there's virtually no risk. Um, so they insure over it. So the homeowner okay. feels fairly sad, fairly comfortable that they don't have an issue. Okay. Uh, obviously, obviously the bank did when they. I assume there's a mortgage on the property. Right, right. All uh, ten years ago or whatever. Uh, right. Okay. Well, that that I was just uh, I was just wondering why this is even an issue since it seemed to be a kind of a no man's land, but it sounds like it's reverted to the neighbors. So the property line, therefore, is an issue with the variance mm -hmm. uh, uh, being four feet or whatever that whatever that's showing. Because um, I was going to say otherwise, why is this? Why is this an issue? So anyway, thank you for no, answering the question. No problem. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Are there any other members of the public who wish to address this application? Seeing none, as chair, I'm gonna go ahead and close the public comment period for this hearing. Um, so what the board has before it, um, we have two uh, separate um, requests. The first is a request for a special permit, uh, which is filed under Section 539D of the zoning bylaw. Uh, this is the request to put uh, a gabled roof over the, the top uh, landing and extending over the first step of the existing entry to the house, um, where this is being built upon an existing stair it requires a special permit from the zoning board of appeals there are no special conditions um, excuse me no special findings that are required for this um, it is just the standard findings and uh, the second is a variance request um, and the variance is for the addition uh, that was that we've been discussing um, it will be, be causing some uh, some further issues in terms of it uh, the reducing the what would be the rear yard setback, but it's also um, will create a new nonconformity with regard to the front yard setback, uh, where currently it's at 25 feet. This will reduce that to 21.3, um, which will make it a new nonconformity, which is uh, what is requiring the uh, the issuance of a variance. Um, as Mrs. O'Connor had. Uh, walked through with us and had included in the application for the variance. Um, uh, she had addressed the, the primary questions that are required uh, for variance, um, which I'll come back to in a minute. Um, but uh, just re returning to the special permit application. Um, so there are uh, seven tests that the, the board needs to uh, apply to a special permit. Um, 
So one is that the adverse effects of the proposed use will not outweigh its beneficial impacts. Now these relate solely to the covering over the porch. These questions only relate to that. Um, so the adverse effects of the porch are certainly um, well outweighed by the beneficial impacts, uh, both to the applicant and also um, in general to the neighborhood as it provides a place for uh, for gathering in the public realm in front of the house. Um, requested use is allowed by special permit um, in the district, which it is under section uh, 539D. Uh, the requested use is essential or desirable to public convenience or welfare. Um, as, as Ms. O'Connor has stated, this is a convenience for the for the homeowners and their ability to uh, take a minute and find their keys if they're in the rain uh, before entering their home. And it uh, creates a, a public space where they can um, see their neighbors. It would not create any undue traffic congestion or impair pedestrian safety. Wouldn't do either of those. It's well back from the street. Um, will not overload any public system. It wouldn't have any impacts on any uh, current utilities or public systems. Uh, there are no special regulations for the requested use. Um, as O'Connor had addressed the question on the character integrity of the neighborhood, it's very much in keeping with um, with the neighborhood to have a uh, covering like this at an entrance. Um, will not be detrimental to the public health or welfare. Uh, the, Certainly doesn't apply here, and the requested use will not cause an excess of use detrimental to the neighborhood, um, which this, this would not do either. Um, were there, and so those are the, the required findings for the special permit uh, to cover the existing uh, stair and landing. Um, for the board to approve the special permit, um, there are three standard conditions that the board would apply to a case like this which I'll just read it quickly into the record. The first is that the plans and specifications approved by the board for the special permit shall be the final plans and specifications submitted to the building inspector of the town of Arlington in connection with this application for zoning relief. There should be no deviation during construction from approved plans and specifications without the express written approval of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, the second is that the building inspector is hereby notified there to monitor the site and should proceed with appropriate enforcement procedures at any time they determine that violations are present. The building inspector shall proceed under section 3.1 of the zoning bylaw and under the provisions of chapter 40, section 21D of the Massachusetts general laws and institute non-criminal complaints. If necessary, the building inspector may also approve and institute appropriate criminal action also in accordance with section 3.1. And the third is that the board shall maintain continuing jurisdiction with respect to the special permit grant. Um, should the board uh, choose to approve this application, are there any conditions, uh, any additional conditions that the board would feel would be necessary in regards to um, this covering over the front steps? So seeing a none, that would be those three conditions. Um, so I would like to go ahead and just do the vote on the, um, unless there's any additional comments, I think we would be prepared to close. Can we, that's a good question. Mr. Hanlon. <laughs> no, you Are can't we, do that. There's only one public hearing. We can't close one hearing. half. Okay. No. Yeah. You, All right. Perfect. So then we will move on to the variance side of things. Um, so as we discussed prior, uh, there are four conditions that we divide the conditions up into four sections uh, for review. Uh, the first is uh, why circumstances relating to the soil conditions, shape, or topography, especially affecting such land or structures, but not affecting generally the zoning district in which it is located, that would substantiate the granting of a variance. Um, as Ms. O'Connor had laid out in her memorandum and uh, discussed with the board, this is a highly unusually shaped site uh, with a very acute angle at one end. Um, and the area of the site that is actually developable under the zoning bylaw is rather small. Uh, the house that is there now is non-conforming um, and could not be shifted on the site to make it conforming. Uh, this that site is so tight. Um, and the request to have some additional space and to have a home that is generally the size of uh, the other houses in the district, is, um, to my mind, is not a 
you know, an unusual request, uh, but it's not something that they would be able to do uh, without a variance due to the, the shape of the site. Um, so the board needs to make this finding the way we've typically done this in the past is we just sort of do a little straw poll on the um, among members of the board just to make sure that we're all in the same general sense. Um, so I would just ask, are there any members of the board who could not make a finding um, that the, sh part, the shape of the site um, would substantiate the granting of a variance? Hearing none, we'll move to the second criteria. By literal enforcement of the provisions of the zoning bylaw, specifically relating to the circumstances affecting the land or structure noted above, would involve substantial hardship, financial or otherwise, to the petitioner or appellant. Um, so that I'm just going to go back to Ms. O'Connor's um, memorandum on this question. Um, so she just notes that uh, it would involve a substantial hardship, financial or otherwise, to the appellant. Um, essentially, the, the house would be limited to the size that it is today um, and would not be able to be expanded upon um, were the zoning bylaw to be um, implemented as such. And I think the zoning bylaw is not intended, um, you know, obviously does not apply to all circumstances. And in this uh, situation, uh, requiring the house to remain in the, the small format it is without a provision for um, a garage space for a vehicle uh, could in this day and age be considered um, a hardship. Um, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Uh, in the past, <clears throat> we've tended to settle into a kind of a test where when people are doing what everybody else when people would like to do what everybody else is doing, what is normal to be done in Arlington, the kind of things that people do to their houses that virtually everybody may have an interest in doing from time to time, that we've treated that as a substantial hardship. And I, I wouldn't back away from that position now. It seems to me that that is a good test. If this was, you know, uh, if this was a castle or something like that and people were proposing to fortify it against the invasion of the infidel, then that may be a little different. But this is just an ordinary, in fact, a little bit less than what we often see. Uh, and it seems to me that it's a very reasonable thing for somebody proposed to do and that it is a hardship in the way that we've looked at it. Uh, it is a hardship if, because of the way in which the shape of the lot works, they're not able to do that. I do want to stress, however, that the one thing we cannot take into account is the special circumstances of the person who happens to own the property at one time. And the record should be really clear that as sympathetic as I am to the limitations that the applicants have individually in dealing with the allocation of space, the size, and, and the various things that motivate this, those are things that we're not legally able to take into account. Uh, this has to relate entirely to the land, no matter who, no matter who uh, uh, happens to have it, and no matter what their individual circumstances may be. But I don't think we need to go there. Uh, if if there if that had not fit, entered the picture, it's, it would still be true that the applicant wishes to do what most everybody in Elson Arlington can do, and they can't because of the peculiar way in which the zoning ordinance applies to the situation of their land. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Mr. Chairman? Yes. So very quickly, I would say that I also take into consideration the fact that it's a conforming lot in terms of area at 6,001 square feet, right? So, you know, ordinarily somebody with a lot of that size would be able right. to do what they wanted to do with it. So I think it's even sort of a more compelling argument under these circumstances. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. So with that, are there any members of the board who could not make a standing, make a finding that a literal enforcement of the provisions of the zoning bylaw, specifically relating to the circumstances affecting the land or structure noted above, would involve a substantial hardship, financial or otherwise, to the petitioner or appellant? 
All right, none. I will move to the third test. Uh, so desirable relief may be granted without substantial detriment to the public good. Um, as has been noted, this is a very <laughs> modestly sized addition. It is really limited in scope to just the essential pieces that the um, appellants had requested. Um, it's very much in keeping with the scale of the neighborhood um, and uh, would not, it's not creating anything or doing anything that would be unexpected um, in a neighborhood such as this and would not be a, uh, be a detriment to the public good. Uh, so with that, are there any members of the board who feel they could not substantiate uh, finding uh, the desirable relief can be granted without a substantial detriment to the public good? Mr. Chairman? Mr. Hanlon. So I'm going to answer that. No, I, I don't have any problem with that, but there is a discussion that we previously had that I wanted to relate back to. Um, I think that, it, I mean, almost everybody on Janet Street uh, has submitted a letter in support of the application, which is a pretty good indication that the people most affected um, think it's in conformity with, with the, the way they view their neighborhood. There is still the question of the residential design guidelines that I don't want to get past. Uh, that doesn't really come up so much in the with respect to the special permit, but it comes up here. Um, I, I think that we had a considerable discussion about how to deal with the blankness of the of the face that is above the door. Um, but I do think that that. We ought not to forget that Mr. St. Clair was not necessarily opposed to the uh, at least doing something with the door to break that up. Uh, and and he mentioned the having windows, which is which is sort of would be the prevailing pattern on the street. Um, and I think that that fits into the the inquiry we're making right now. Uh, we, there was an issue that we talked a fair amount about, about uh, the guidelines and, and those come into effect when you talk about the conformity with the neighborhood. Um, and I'm sort of hoping that at the very least, the garage door part of it is something that there's a consensus on. Uh, I'm not quite sure what to do about the rest of it. I don't think anyone, there was, it was a useful and helpful discussion, but not too helpful for devising conditions right now. But I do think that the applicant should expect a condition uh, if we are inclined to approve this, that at least relates to the issue that there seemed to be a consensus on, which had to do with the, with the surface of the, uh, of the garage door. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. So then moving on to the fourth test, uh, how desirable relief may be granted without nullifying or substantially derogating from the intent or purpose of the zoning bylaw. Um, so the, the purpose and intent of the zoning bylaw uh, is, the, is the first section of the bylaw. It contains a lot of uh, verbiage about um, sort of maintaining the, maintaining the town, about providing for uh, space, for privacy, for um, air, and and other such things, um, the location and placement of this garage does not uh, close off or cause uh, an impact on other residents in a way that they would not be able to enjoy their homes, um, and so it does not um, substantially derogate from the intent or purpose of the bylaw. Um, it's in keeping with that purpose. It's just unfortunately given the shape of the site, um, it's unable to do so without the granting of a variance. Um, are there any members of the board who would be unable to um, substantiate a finding that desirable relief can be granted without nullifying or substantially derogating from the intent or purpose of the zoning bylaw? Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. I, I think that, um, you know, I think that the size of the garage is appropriate. And I, I you know, we've gone through the, the first three tests and I, I think that those all passed for me, but you know, one thing I'm concerned about here is four feet is, is quite, quite tight. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, that's like, uh, you know, uh, a residential corridor in a house to get by that corner. 
And we're, you know, as we've seen and talked about earlier in the in the hearing, there's a fence right there. That's it, it really is uh, quite a quite a uh, tight condition to have a two story structure four mm -hmm. feet from a property line. So, uh, I, you know, I, I'm uh, happy to listen to what everyone else on the board thinks, but I do think that um, I, I think this is a great candidate for a variance because the, I think the need is there and this is an appropriate use of the space. But I I think that four feet does sort of um, uh, cause a little bit of concern for me. Thank you for that. Um, like I said, I would ask Mr. St. Clair, I'm pretty sure that four feet is that the garage itself is about as small as it can be in order to still accommodate a car. It is. I mean, you, you, if you, if you needed to take a little bit off, you could, but it does affect how the, um, it does begin to affect, you know, how that ties into that, that collector corridor and connects to the rest of the house. But, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to stir the pot here, but it's, <laughs> isn't it the fence? That's the thing that shouldn't be there maybe then. Um, but I, I hate for the, the addition to be made smaller than it would otherwise need to be just because somebody put a fence up on a right of way. You yeah. know, it, it was our impression that we, there wouldn't be a fence there and maybe they did it in the dark of the night. Maybe they did it with everybody looking at it. I don't know, but, um, and maybe, maybe that right of way we, that's not on our client's site. We didn't do a title search. Maybe that's gone away, but that's what came up when the surveyor did the work. So, and you know, if they, built the fence, you know, you don't want to be a bad neighbor to them, let, let them <laughs> deal with that on their own. But, you know, you can, you can build this four feet away. It doesn't prevent you from building it. Um, you know, if, and if it was an inconvenience during construction, they could take down a section of the fence and have that be as a work zone and then put it back up. You know, that could be something that the contractor works out. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it, is it what do you need that space there for in the future you're going to need to run your lawnmower through there and the kids are going to want to run from the side yard to the backyard you know if you make it five feet is it really that much different if you make it eight feet then you've taken four feet out of the garage and you basically made that obsolete yeah mr chairman yes sir mr hanlon um so if you look at the GIS map of the property, I, I don't know if you can readily do that. I could do it if I understood how to share my screen, but I don't. Um, but if you look at where the four feet would be, it's located in a position that's really quite a distance away from the houses at 34 Lansdowne Street and 42 Lansdowne Street, which are the ones that, that are closest to that. Um, now that's when you're just dealing strictly with a setback, that's not as important as it otherwise is in, in some other circumstances. But when we deal with the way in which large additions uh, may or may not impinge upon the uh, uh, the uh, rights of abutters, we do take into consideration what's actually built on the uh, on the abutters land. We we don't have the occupants of 34 or 42 uh, coming and and supporting this the way we do everybody else on Janet Street. Um, but this isn't nearly as close as it would be if those houses, which are sort of forward towards Landon Street, were set back further in the lot so that this would sort of loom over their backyards. And they've already more or less protected themselves by building a fence there. Uh, in a way, when you look at the GIS map, uh, what you see is sort of the shadow of that 20-foot uh, right-of-way that's been incorporated into the backyards, and, and, and appropriately, too. It's only an easement. It, the people who own those properties have the fee interest, um, but that is sort of standing as a way of augmenting the backyards of those other houses and reducing the potential impact of this edition uh, approaching 
uh, with, so close to the uh, to the lot line. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Okay. So, should the board um, vote to move forward with this application? Uh, the same three conditions that we applied for the special permit would also apply to the variance. Um, I was going to propose an additional condition uh, that the garage door is to be provided with a row of great glazed panels, either as a transom or as door lights, so that there'd either be a row of glass above the door or a row of glass as a part of the door. Um, and I think that sort of gets at what uh, we had been discussing with the with the appellant um, as we went through this hearing. Um, are there any other conditions that members of the board feel would be appropriate for this um, variance request? So hearing none. Um, So I would ask Mr. Hanlon if he would be prepared to prepare a written decision um, for this uh, docket um, being written in favor of approval. Hey, Mr. Chairman, I have no difficulty with that. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Um, Unless there's any other questions in regards to this application, I think the board has all the information it needs. Um, and so the I would uh, accept a motion to close the public hearing on um, this docket, which is 3817, uh, 15 Janet Road. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Uh, so this is a uh, motion to close the public hearing for docket 3817 15 Janet Road. Um, so uh, we'll ask, uh, so ask members to vote yes or no on closing. Uh, Mr. DuPont. Yes. Mr. Hanlon. Yes. Mr. Holly. Yes. Mr. Riccardelli. Yes. And the chair votes yes. Uh, so we are closed on uh, this public hearing. So the board will prepare a written decision that will be provided um, to the board for review, and that will come up and vote at our next uh, scheduled hearing, which is on Tuesday, October 8th, will be the final vote on that date. I'd like to thank the board for their time. You're very thank welcome. You very, thank you. Very thank you so much. useful discussion. Thank you all. Thank you all. So with that, going back to Thank our Thank you. agenda, Thank you. you're welcome. Uh, this brings up item 11 on our agenda, which is uh, docket 3813, 928 Massachusetts Avenue. This is an appeal of a building permit. Uh, so I could, if I could ask the applicants to go ahead and introduce themselves um, and tell us what is at issue. Yes, good evening, Chairman Klein and members of the board. Uh, my name is Kiernan Matthews. I am joined by Susie Sanchez, and we've been residents at 13 Highland Ave for over 15 years. And this is our first matter before the board, so I will appreciate your understanding and, and help if we get any terminology wrong or, or any matters process wrong. So uh, appreciate that. So tonight we're asking the ZBA to make uh, what we think is a relatively narrow determination uh, to render a decision to withdraw this building permit until a special permit or variance application is filed by Downhower Capital LLC. And uh, and then, you know, perhaps approved by the board only after a full hearing, considering all information, including the butter, uh, a butter's concerns. So our appeal requests your scrutiny of two main issues with this project, number one, is the impacts on, including destruction of uh, our abutters property, such as our own. And the number two is increasing an existing nonconformity. So we think the conditions for a special permit or variance application are clear on these two points. Uh, are we, we're, this is what we hope we bring to you tonight for discussion and your consideration. And if the board agrees, I hope this, uh, this might be a relatively brief conversation. Uh, but the applicant uploaded uh, only a few days ago 
uh, a few dozen pages of exhibits and rebuttals. Um, this is two months after our, our appeal was filed. Uh, but without more time to consider that information, I, our quick review leads us to think that most of that material would be suitable for consideration at a special permit hearing, um, but we think largely out of the scope of this appeal before the ZBA. So we think a special permit will suss out the accommodations to abutters, the setback ambiguities, uh, the applicants uh, self-professed placeholders on the drawings that have been submitted for the, and that received this permit. Mm -hmm. and ultimately assure that Dowenhower Capital's assurances to abutters are on the record in a manner in which this body can can uh, can hold accountable. So I have I can go through in greater detail each of these points if you like. I uh, would ask to share my screen if you want to go through that or we're open to your questions and uh, sure. issues right now. Um, Ms. Ralston, if you wouldn't mind um, giving Mr. Matthews uh, the ability to share his screen. You should be all set. Great, thank you. Great. So the first issue, as I mentioned, is that this project will cause destruction to our property, and this was not disclosed in the building permit application. So Mr. Champion would have had none, not, would not have had this information in, in making his determination. Um, I wanna point out that everyone agrees that the retaining wall urgently needs to be addressed. Um, that this retaining wall design uh, will destroy an 80 foot cottonwood tree on our property. It will, uh, the cutting of roots that this current design would require will cause this tree to fail. And I've, our, um, our exhibits provided evidence both by our arborist and, and the uh, applicant's arborist, engineer, and others uh, asserting to this. And that the vet tree has a not insignificant value to us, uh, a property value to us. That is also uh, admitted in writing by the applicant in the materials he submitted since uh, you know, in response to this uh, this appeal. Mm -hmm. So in addition, there are six smaller trees and other plantings likely to be affected by the construction activity of the new wall. Um, these are arborvitae and uh, dogwood and, and uh, another small tree. All right. uh, just a, a image to kind of place us in your mind. I know uh, the board does its homework and and uh, cases the the joint. So uh, yeah, this is some images of what we've uh, you know what the current conditions are. Uh, this is the the fence that we had up on our property that had been on that property for 19 years um, and that we had taken care of for the 15 years that were um, uh, that that we've been here. And we only learned through this process that that fence was in fact placed uh, by a few inches on uh, on the uh, applicant's property. And this is the view of this eight, the eighty foot tree in question from our uh, from our second story window. So there are, are other uh, questions that other additional impacts to that will this uh, project will cause to our property. Um, the grade changes within a setback buffer um, raises some issues. Uh, there's some questions about the current design raising the grade by 12 inches immediately adjacent to the property line. And it's mm -hmm. unclear in the any of the materials submitted so far how this new grade is resolved without adjusting our, the abutters, our, our own existing and natural grade. The second issue is an ambiguous excavation line. Uh, the construction drawings have a limit of work, but not an excavation line. Uh, and if ex excavation is at the property line, uh, all of our trees, as is currently indicated, then all of these trees that I've mentioned will be uh, negatively impacted. Um, so it's our, our, our proposition that setbacks and buffers exist to mitigate these impacts and that the construction activity within them should be subject to uh, a butters review. We could go into this in detail later, but this is just a uh, what we're highlighting about the concerns we have about the changing grade on the um, on the plans that have been submitted. Uh, so our second point in this appeal is that the project increases existing nonconformities, and I have here uh, we have here an excerpt or, or a paraphrase, I should say, of section six one eleven d of the zoning bylaws. Uh, the current nonconformities, the existing nonconformities, is that the paved area that is the parking lot of Darren Howard Capital is uh, 
already within is less than five feet from our property line. The vegetative barrier is less than five feet wide. It's just 42 inches wide. Uh, and the existing seven and a half inch wall is the one that's uh, problematic is three and a half to four feet from our uh, from our property line, uh, which is which is a, a nonconformity. Mm -hmm. So our uh, this project proposes to expand those by uh, reducing the setback by 59 percent. So the new wall is two feet closer. That is only uh, 18 inches to our property line. I should say that at the um, we don't represent the other abutters, but the wall is at the property line is moved to uh, to abut the property line on their um, uh, on their properties. The vegetative barrier will be reduced by half, and um, it you know this it would appear that the applicant is choosing choosing to build uh, towards the property line rather than build away from the property line. Um, at the expense of his uh, parking areas, paved area. So the other issue is that the fence, uh, he has placed the fence on the property line in these drawings. That means that there can be no suitable plantings um, uh, on the opposite side of that fence as the bylaw, um, as the bylaw requests. So our, uh, so all this leads us to say that the applicant could submit a new design or seek a special permit uh, or, or variance, um, but he has not done so. Um, according to the bylaw, any lot, well, I've got it here on the screen. I won't read the slide, um, but uh, setback shouldn't be reduced or changed um, so that the setback's made non-conforming without a special permit. So this seems, um, uh, this, this is why we're presenting this to you. Um, you know, essentially what we're saying is that Darren Hauer Capital has decided that its needs are more important than our needs in this design. I, we don't feel like that's his decision to make. It's for the zoning board to decide whose rights prevail. Um, and we believe he needs a special permit or variance because his construction will affect abutters. Um, and if those new designs in a rebuttal that he submitted marked up with what a bump out would look like around the tree, if he believes that that is a hardship, um, then I believe that's a case he should make at a, a special permit hearing. Um, we just didn't think that this permit should have been granted without that opportunity to uh, to for abutters and and everyone concerned to uh, to address that. So we have some other points of additional context going into kind of we're not going to litigate the every point of the rebuttal that was submitted just a few days ago, um, but we've just for here for you know, the current purposes just summarized our our points now and if uh, in the Q and A that that follows, we can uh, get into other points of context surrounding this. For the it's been going on for fifteen months now or longer, uh, we'd be happy to get into that. Uh, Susie, do you have anything to add? No, I think you, you covered it all. Thank you. All right, Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, go ahead and uh, thank you. Um, are there is there a representative for the? Um, for 928 Massachusetts Avenue on the call. Yes, yes. Joseph Dowenhauer here. I'm the owner of Dowenhauer Capital LLC. Um, so what's been going on here in the last 15 months, um, this wall that is here is failing, needs to be replaced. Um, they have a lodge tree, about 45% of the tree's branches encroach on, on my property. Um, and unfortunately, just the way that this wall was put in many, many years ago, um, like, like they had described, Susie and Kieran had described, that the tree is extremely close. It's about one inch from the property line. So the trunk is actually on the abutters, but you know, close to 50% of the branches and roots kind of come across. Now, in order to replace this wall and rebuild it, there's there's no design that is going to save this tree at this point um, because taking the wall down itself becomes a risk because then the tree could actually collapse in the process of redoing this wall. Um, and that's been said both by my engineer and arborist. Um, you can see that in Exhibit B. Um, I apologize for the long rebuttal that I, that I had written, but there was a you know this has been going on a long time, and a lot of time and effort has been put in by myself into designing this wall in order to make sure that it's safe for the entire community. You know, we have little kids, we have lots of people living in this building, and it is essential that this wall gets replaced. Um, 
And so the new retaining wall is going to be constructed in the same location as the existing wall with the front face of the new wall lying approximately in the same location as the current structure's front face. Additionally, the parking will remain exactly the same. The parking area is an existing feature and there'll be no changes to its dimension. The only change is going to be the wall, the thickness of the wall, as opposed to being eight inches, it's going to be, you know, 25 to 30 inches thick, but you're not going to even see that because it's going to be covered by dirt. So by looking at the wall after it's done, you're not even going to be able to tell there's any change at all in the parking area. So I don't feel a variance is really needed in this particular, in this particular case. Now, just today alone, um, you know, the abutters came back, you know, me and my lawyer had offered them $7,500 for the tree and to take down the tree. So with that $7,500, the abutters would take that money, take down the tree and their other shrubs and move their other shrubs and still have money left over for compensation for the tree. And this, this is a very fair number. And, you know, we feel like, to be honest, the tree itself is is their liability. They're the ones that should be paying to take it down. But we 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 want to we want to do what's best for the community. We want the community safe, and so we offered to give them this amount of money. Now they today came back with a fifteen thousand dollar number, and if we if I give them that money, then they'll all of a sudden they'll drop all of them magically. All the problems will will stop with having to do with all these design issues because there is no design issues. The wall has been vetted by an engineer. He's eighty years old. He's been doing this for fifty years. And I have spoken with him through five iterations of the wall design. And he has said, there is no problems. We've done this in tight spaces. She's just trying to give you a hard time. And so it's, it's you know, I could go through the individual issues, but really just the fact that they're willing to settle for 15,000 and not 7,500 goes to show you that these issues really, the design is fine. It, it, it's not flawed in any way. And if you go through, you know, my report that I, the letter that I wrote, I go into detail all these different things now. It's unfortunate, and I, I obviously have empathy towards the fact that many years ago, it was a bad um, survey that the abutters got, and they happened to put this large tree and several other shrubs and their fence and their irrigation system all on my property. And unfortunately, it's just, you know, they're looking for compensation to compensate for all that, and it, it's, not, it's not reasonable to expect that. Um, now, the fact of the matter is, is that this has been going on a long time. And this this year is the, over a year and a half it's been going on. This wall needs to be replaced. It's in the best interest of the entire community. I had 16 tenants sign a um, affidavit, um, which I, I sent to Colleen today, but I don't think it was uploaded, um, but I had sent it. She has it. Um, a lot of majority of tenants supporting this project to rebuild this wall. I have workers back there. I have family members of people that come. There is hundreds of people that walk in front of this wall. And it is a danger and needs to be replaced. If if today this appeal gets granted, then that means the project is not going to end up happening in 2024. And that would be very, very upsetting because it, it you know, these contractors are busy. They have snow things coming up. So they're not going to be able to probably do the project if I don't get started in the next two weeks with it. Um, and so I just really want to get this project done. I feel like it's important to the safety of the community. I feel like I've already gone above and beyond by offering them a large chunk of money that they can repair their backyard and put it back in the same exact way. It's more than fair. Um, and so I respectfully ask to continue to grant this permit so I can fix this wall and, and do what I need to do. There is no special permit necessary. I particularly designed the wall so that it goes back in the same exact location. Now, it is non-conforming in the sense that the setback is, you know, it's like four feet, 10 inches, and then it kind of goes in a little bit. It's between like that, you know, three and a half to, to five feet mark. It's not perfectly five feet, but that's why I kept it in the same place so that it would be just go back in the same place and there'd be no issues with this. All they want to do here at this point is delay this because it's a money grab situation where they're looking to get more money out of us. And that's it. And the process of Mr. doing Chairman, that Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, yep. could you please instruct this person to stop making denigrating comments about the people on the other side of this. I've heard enough of that. Okay. Thank you, sure. I'm just fine. telling you that the situation that's going on, because I think it's important and pertinent to the situation in terms of, uh, in terms of their design issues, that there really would be no design issues if a proper, a large amount of money was met. So it goes, um, that, that, I think that's very pertinent to the situation. Okay. Um, um so I, I, I think in full disclosure, for the members of the board, um, there is ongoing litigation over this. Um, that I, I don't know the, the exact period of it, but there is litigation currently between uh, the two, between the appellant, um, the person who's filing the, um, the, 
the request to overturn the decision to issue the permit and the property owner who has issued the permit. Um, and so I, I think we've heard and I appreciate Mr. DuPont's uh, speaking up that there are, this is um, something that's been going on for a long time and there's a lot of uh, potentially frayed nerves and, and whatnot on this. And um, I can update you on the case though, what's happening. So we had a um, pre-trial. Well, to... at this point, at, at this point, we do need to move forward. Um, so I think we sort of understand the, the basis of it. Um, I've asked um, the inspector of buildings, uh, Mike Champa, to join us this evening. Um, I had had a prior conversation with him um, just sort of to sort of get the the basics of the of of the understanding of the permit. Um, so the. Um, there, I'm going to go ahead and share, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Chairman. While you do that, I I think that it's important for us to realize that, and for the applicant and for all of the participants to realize that our job is not to decide the rights and wrongs of this matter. Uh, we're not the court. We don't have any proceeding before us that raises most of the issues that have been talked about. The one issue that's before us is whether what Mr. Chompa's decision was, was contrary to the zoning bylaw. And if it, if it wasn't, then even if it was a mistake, which I'm not suggesting for a moment that it was, um, but if it isn't contrary to the zoning bylaw, we have no authority to go and reverse it. We don't have, so, the only issues that it seems to me that are here are questions about whether or not aspects of the decision that have been raised that relate to maintaining certain setback requirements and vegetated spaces and so forth. That at least raises a zoning bylaw issue. Um, the other things have to do with longstanding disputes, and I understand why people are upset about those things. Uh, I, I will point out that if we were a court, we would exclude evidence of some of us of settlement negotiations precisely because we want to protect that sort of thing. So we would not have allowed any any discussion of that. But we did. We've seen it already. I, I agree with Mr. DuPont that we should ignore it. Uh, and we should turn to Mr. Champa is actually the respondent in this case. It's not Mr. Donhauer. And it's up to Mr. Champa to explain what the legal situation is and what the legal basis is of, of the decision that he made. That's the only thing that's really before us. Thank you for that, Mr. Hanlon. Um, so this is the, the permit application that was filed. Um, so it's listed as repair work uh, to rebuild the retaining wall in the rear of the property. Um, uh, plans and construction documents are provided. Uh, they'll be building a new retaining wall, demolishing the old wall that is failing. Um, the dumpster sub is substantial improvement work planned. No. Uh, then just some basics about the existing property, uh, site information. Um, it's not a flood zone. Not, it is uh, special. It's an R6. So it's an apartment complex. Um, information about the construction of the building, construction control, so responsible professional, um, which is listed here, the general contractor, um, you know, workers' compensation, certificate of occupancy, ownership, um, affidavit in regards to um, uh, demolition and the debris, all basics, application, declarations, a good neighbor agreement. Um, so this is the application. So in the application, the indicated scope of work um, is that building a new retaining wall, demolishing the old wall that is failing. Um, so under our bylaws, um, let's see. Go ahead and um, do 
So section 815, unsafe structure, except as covered under 817, any structure determined to be unsafe by the director of inspectional services or their designee is authorized under the provisions of 143 may be restored to a safe condition provided such work on any non-conforming structure shall be completed within one year of the determination of the structure is unsafe and it shall not place the structure in greater non-conformity. A structure may be exempted from this provision by a special permit granted by the Board of Appeals or in cases subject to EDR by the Arlington Redevelopment Board. Um, so I would just ask um, Mr. Champa if you would just confirm that um, this retaining wall is indeed unsafe. That's correct. It is unsafe. Uh, I would also like to add that there's a condition on the permit, regardless of the uh, the drawings, that the wall be built back in the same place as the existing wall. I know that um, the plan had showed it a little different, but uh, there is a condition that the wall be rebuilt where the existing wall sits now. And, and part of the problem with the existing wall is because it's so thin, it's not structurally able to support what it needs to be supported. We understand the wall that is proposed is a thicker wall. And I just want to confirm that the when we say it's being put back in the same place, that the point that's in the same place is where it meets the driveway. Is that correct? The face of the, the, face of the wall will, will be in the same place as the existing wall. OK. Um, and, okay. and when, we, when we discuss the um the setback for the parking off of the property line that parking setback is to that same point the front face of the of the wall that's correct okay um Are there, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing this. I'm going to ask members of the board if they have questions or comments. Mr. Chair, I have, I have a question. Yeah, please, Mr. Cadelli. So I think I'll I think I'll direct this to Mr. Champ if that's okay. Um, please. So, so um, uh, it looks like, at least from the the application material that was presented tonight, that the existing precast or cast in place wall is being replaced by a pre-manufactured wall. Uh, and one of the one of the points that um, the appeal brought up was that the support of excavation would require excavation onto the neighboring properties um, land. Did you um, was there any discussion about that or any condition that all of this construction had to happen on the, the owner's property? Uh, there was not, it, it, even if they were replacing that wall with another seven and a half or eight inch poured concrete wall, it would be impossible to do without disturbing the, the abutters property. Okay. Mr. Champion, how is that typically addressed um, when projects are like that are in encountered that have to be against the, the property line? So the, the property owner uh, performing the work in cases where it's it, the work can only be done um, by disturbing an abutting property, the, the property owner doing the work would be responsible for restoring that property. Okay. And it's, um, there's no provision in the approval process for a building permit that, um, would make the, the the permit contingent on any kind of prior arrangement in terms of access to it in the budding property? Uh, no, it would become a civil matter. It's it's okay. not something that's strictly a, a building code regulation. Okay, thank you. Any questions from the board? So uh, can I just follow up on that point um, with Mr. Champa? So does that mean if it's a civil matter that it's just up to the two parties to negotiate some sort of an arrangement to protect the, the abutter? Or is there some other provision somewhere that provides, for instance, that there has to be some sort of 
insurance policy that, you know, say the contractor carries to assure the abutter that they don't suffer any damage and any damage will be uh, compensated. I, I'm just curious about that because it seems to be a big item, but if it's not in our sort of jurisdiction as far as the building department, it's it's something obviously that needs to be addressed. So there is a process by which uh, a bond is placed. I, I believe it's held by the police department. Um, I, I don't know how that regulation was was created or why it was created, but um, it's more that is more so for uh, when you need to uh, when you need to to go onto your uh, in a butter's property to be able to perform work on your own house. Um, and the bond is only a thousand dollars. I say it would it would become a civil matter because if it couldn't be agreed upon between the property owners, it's not something that falls within the building code regulations okay. or the zoning bylaw regulations to, um, you know, for us to mediate that. Got it. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Dupont. Um, Mr. Any other questions from the board? Um, I know the yeah, appellant. Yeah. The I was just going to say that I know the appellant had a question, or so. Um, go ahead. So sure, it's a question for Mr. Chiampa. Um, in determining whether it's a non-conforming, an existing non-conforming, or increasing the non-conformity, you mentioned that you're considering the front face of the wall, or the, I mean the the driveway face of the wall, which is effectively you know, the interior face of the wall. Right. So, but typically it's the ex, is it not the exterior face of the wall that would have to also sit within the setback? Because for us, well, the back face of the wall is really the, you know, the, the exterior face of the wall to us. And that is getting about two feet closer to the property line. Sure. And uh, what we took into consideration in that matter was that the uh, the wall is underground. It's if they were building a wall above grade, um, we would be considering the distance in, in that way from there to the property line because it would be an obstruction that um, you know you would have to look at a six foot wall. Whereas uh, you know as it's designed. You shouldn't. It shouldn't look much different. It would just. It's just that the wall needs to be thicker, um, in order to support the the pressure that it, it needs to resist. May I just say, it, it you you just said it wouldn't look different. In fact, it, it would look quite different for us because there's an eighty foot tree which would be necessarily gone. So it does significantly change because what is happening below grade. Mm -hmm. It's also relevant to our property. I just wanted to make that point. No, absolutely, and I sympathize with that. Unfortunately, it's it's not something that's within our jurisdiction. Um, Mr. Downhauser? Oh, I was just going to say that. Yeah, it's unfortunate that um, this large tree, which is a beautiful tree, it just it just encroaches so much across the property line that there's just no possible way to rebuild this wall without you know pruning some of those those roots and inevitably the tree probably will end up failing as a result of it. And that's why I, you know, I made that offer to them because I understand that, you know, it, that our backyard is going to end up looking differently. Oh, thank you for that. Um, so I basically what the board so the with the, the appellants had had uh, had noted in their presentation at the start. Um, so one has to do with the the setback, and I understand this is it's it's difficult because it it deals with the thickness of a of the structure that's being installed. Um, the requirement for the setback is uh, it's a parking area setback, and so the parking hat it's the, the it's the point at which the parking ends is where the setback begins and so the retaining wall is within that setback um and is, is within the depth of that setback so as has been expressed by um by the the the, the building owner who filed the application um and confirmed by mr champa that the that line is not going to be affected by the work that 
the, the where the parking lot ends today is where the parking lot is going to end after all this work has been completed. Um, the thickness of the wall will be um, will intrude into uh, what's currently the setback area, but it is below grade. Um, and as such, it's not it's not an above ground structure that is being moved closer. Um, as you know, it's not like a house is being moved closer. It's not like an above ground retaining wall that's being moved closer to the um, to the budding property. It is uh, the underground portion, and unfortunately, as it you know, as, as we've noted, it does have some severe impacts on uh, the way that the the abutters property is currently being uh, is currently configured and it is currently being enjoyed, um, and that that's for the uh, the portion of it. Um, in terms of the the planting, um, the the bylaws do require some plantings. The existing condition doesn't have plantings. Um, and by those photos that were shown earlier, um, and so um, I I think it's up up to the board. We can have a we should probably have some more discussion, but. Um, Seeing an additional hand raised reminds me that we have not yet opened this hearing for public comment. This is probably an appropriate time to do so. Um, so with that, um, quickly note that um, public questions and comments are taken as they relate to the matter at hand and should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing its decision. Members of the public will be granted time to ask questions and make comments. Um, members of the public who wish to speak should digitally raise their hand using the button on the reaction tab on the Zoom application. If you're calling in by phone, you may dial star nine to indicate you'd like to speak. You'll be called upon by the chair, asked to give your name and address to the record and given time for your questions and comments. Um, so with that, um, can I speak or Christian uh, just disappeared? Yep. Yeah. No, oh, Mr. Vargley, you are. Excuse me, Mr. Klein just disappeared. Sorry. I, I know Christian personally as well. Um <laughs> uh Mr. Klein personally as well. Um so I'm uh, my name is Mustafa Varaglu. Um I'm a friend of the abutter. Um I'm also a town meeting member for Precinct 10. Um and I'd just like to um um I, I want to keep this on topic, but I will just say that at town meeting we have voted often to um, increase density, increase, um, decrease some setbacks and allow apartment buildings along Mass Ave in particular and a few other places. And we've heard from many abutters during those votes about fears of those developments on their properties. Um, and in this case, um, I think a lot of these things are kind of coming to a head. Um, there is an existing nonconformity, the, um, to replace something at the existing nonconformity in the suitable way is going to create damage to an abutter. Um, I think that's all been acknowledged by the board and 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 the um, and and the uh, property owners. Um, and I would just question why the um, why the wall cannot be brought out even a foot or two or eighteen inches away from there to maintain to basically reduce the nonconformity in these types of situations to provide. Um, to provide relief for the abutters while allowing the um, the property owner to have parking spaces because it sounds like there is room for those parking spaces. And also in that case, then maybe the back face of the wall, um, the face um, facing the applicant's property, um, not the apartments, um, would then be about the same place as the current front face of the wall. And, um, and, and I think that would be some kind of relief and then the idea that you know you won't see it, but it'll be two feet of concrete, precluding other um, vegetation to grow on top of it. Um, that also will basically extend the nonconformity or entrench it forever, or for until the wall is replaced in the future. So I think this um, issue of the nonconformity and the existing nonconformity um, is as maybe a way to address um, the position of the wall, because it certainly wasn't my intent in all those votes to reduce a butter's property's value to in, in sort of very tangible ways in terms of losing property or losing um, trees and other um, pieces of their property. So that, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Well, thank you for that. Um, 
I did want to just briefly ask Mr. Champ if he knows, um, is the existing par parking area conforming with the parking regulations for Arlington or is it already undersized or oversized? Uh, the drive lane is already significantly uh, undersized. I, I, it would be challenging. I believe it's already challenging for cars to uh, enter and exit the parking lot. Um, and it would become more challenging to, to shrink that drive lane down more. Um, uh, next speaker uh, is Mr. Steve Moore. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Um, one of the things I, I want to relate uh, related to this particular case is um, the board is uh, very familiar with my general interest in, in trees and canopy preservation in town. I do lots of things to support that. And um, uh, this particular tree, this large tree with uh, uh, decent canopy and definitely uh, uh, healthy on the on the good side of healthy, is something uh, which is worth considering in this discussion. Um, and clearly, the uh, the folks that are are wanting to appeal the decision are are considering that. Uh, one of the things that we've been doing increasingly in town is considering trees uh, in the community as a public good. That includes trees on private property, trees on public property, uh, and the value, the benefit of the trees is shared by the entire community, not just the people whose property it's on or the people who are next to the, that property. Um, so the, the health of the tree and consideration of it for the community's good and can, is uh, something that is, I think, properly considered and positively so. Um, uh, that being said, um, the solution here, I think, is not that complicated, but it does require using more of the current driveway and parking area to cast uh, a, a buttress wall against the wall that currently exists without disturbing the current wall but basically encasing it. Now that would require, just as Ms. Champa points out, uh, a decreasing of an already somewhat constricted driveway. Um, and what I'm thinking is that a reconfiguration of this parking situation might be in order to allow the wall to be, uh, to be put in place. And although I know that that is something that the uh, property owner may not want to consider and would be uh, have an expense involved, um, it definitely would, uh, I think, be something that the abutters would consider positively and be willing to live with uh, with a setback that may not be vegetated as the bylaw requires. Um, uh, my, one question for Mr. Chiampa, though. Um, I would ask the building uh, inspector if, based on the information that we heard from the folks who were doing the appeal, the abutters, uh, are... Is any of the information that he heard that they uh, basically referenced in their arguments something that had he known at the time of the approval of the permit that maybe he did not know that he would take into account now might have uh, affected his decision? I guess the, the question for Mr. Champa is, is there any any new new information that has come in as a course of this hearing that would um change your opinion on the 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 basic facts of the of the uh decision to submit the uh, to approve the permit right there is not no i had you know I, in most cases we issue permits to repair or replace failing walls because they fail uh, in this case the the property owner came to us wanting to replace his wall because he knew it was failing um I, I realize that there's a lot of other stuff going on here, but the fact of the matter is, is that wall could collapse uh, a year from now, or it could collapse during this hearing. Um, it's important that that wall be replaced. And I also would like to say, just while I'm speaking, that uh, reconfiguration of the parking lot isn't possible. I mean, they, it, it's the most effective 
um, use of the space that they have the way that they have it now. I, so I, I don't see it being reconfigured in a way that would, you know, facilitate the needs of, of, of the tenants. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Um, and Mr. Champa, just to follow up on that as well, if the current parking is non-conforming uh, with the bylaws, if we were to um, approve having the, if we were to request that the wall be moved so that it is even further reduced, that would intensify the existing non-conformity, which believe would require a variance on the part of the applicant. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, next I'm gonna call on is Anna Tustison. Hi, um, thank you for having me. Um, I'm speaking um, sort of on behalf of, I'm one of the tenants of the building. Um, so I wanted to hear what um, both parties had to say tonight and just better understand um, the situation. Um, I have lived at the property for the last five years. Um, I will say that um, the condition overall of the, the property as a whole, when I moved in, um, it definitely needed a lot of work. The, the former landlord um, did not take good care of the property. Um, so it's no um, surprise to me that the wall has been in such um, poor disrepair. Um, I just wanted to, I guess, as a tenant, I am concerned as someone that does utilize that parking area. It's already incredibly difficult to navigate back there, especially during snow season. So I would, I would be personally um, very concerned about the ability to navigate that parking area, or even, um, you know, lose potential parking spaces should that wall be moved any closer to the existing apartment building. Um, so that is a concern of mine. I also have concerns personally about just the safety. Again, it could collapse any day, et cetera. It's been there for many, many years. I greatly understand that. I have full respect for the abutting property owners and their concerns about um, you know, the impact to their property. But um, I also have concerns about what should happen if something, um, the wall would fall, there are trees, there's debris that could impact you know, our ability to get into and out of the property safely with our vehicles and even um, the the back doors of the apartment buildings that face that property line. So um, I certainly have a vested interest in hoping that the project can um, proceed in a way um, that is safe and, you know, works well for both parties involved. Um, again, understand, you know, kind of what's at stake in terms of altering anything related to the existing abutters property and hoping that that could get kind of resolved between the two parties outside of um, considerations for this particular appeal. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Um, the next name is Mark R. Yes. Hello. Hello. Uh, Just name and address to the record, please. I'm sorry. Yes. My name is Mark Rayla. I live on Shawnee Road. And I just wanted to add a comment to the record. I am a... Please commuter and pedestrian, frequent pedestrian in this area. I often take the 77 bus to stop and shop and then walk up Highland Ave as part of my daily commute. Walking just a few steps up the street from Mass Ave past this site creates, um, probably due to the diligent effort and efforts of both property owners, it creates a sort of remarkable transitional or buffer zone from the bleakness of the retail area surrounding Stop and Shop. The tree canopy adds an aesthetic appeal and it offers a lot of shade to pedestrians on Highland Avenue. So in my opinion, it would be a mistake to move rush forward with this work without a clear plan for maintaining or replacing the canopy and the vegetation in that area. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other members of the public who would like to address this application? I see that, that both property owners have their hands up, but I'm just going to check and make sure that there's no other um, members of the public who wish to address this hearing. So 
Seeing none, I will go ahead and close the public comment period uh, for this hearing. Um, and, and I will get to the raised hands in just a second. Um, so what the board has in front of it, so this is a, uh, it's an appeal of a decision of the building inspector. Um, that decision was the decision to issue a building permit to allow the existing retaining wall to be removed and a new retaining wall to be constructed um, in the same location. Um, in this case, the, the expression, the same location applies to uh, where the foot of the wall meets the, the parking lot um, on the, the applicant's pro on the applicant for the building permit on that property. Um, and so that is the that is the decision that the board is being asked uh, to review is whether that permit was issued appropriately. Uh, so with that, I will uh, call on um, Mr. Matthews. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so a few issues have come up over the Q&A period over the last several minutes, and I just want to uh, direct some questions to the chairman and to uh, Mr. Champa uh, for points of clarification. Um, and also raise some other con uh, one point of context. Um, one question that I we have is, you know, this decision to allow for a three hundred percent increase in the thickness of the wall into the uh, in, you know encroaching into the uh, buffer or setback. Um, um, it seems conditional that this is an underground wall, um, and I haven't seen any uh, any comment on the uh, application or any materials submitted since then that the uh, that that is a condition because the existing wall is not underground. And as we remarked at the opening uh, in our opening statement, um, there are some unresolved issues of grade. There's no grading plan that accompanied this uh, this building plan showing the difference in grade between the top of the wall, uh, over a very short rise between that wall and our property line and the natural grade that exists on our property line. So I'm wondering, you know, what uh, assurances or, you know, uh, or conditions there are that this wall is, um, is in fact underground and, and out of sight. Um, and my second and related question to that is whether the, uh, to what extent the setback is, should be protected by the construction activity it's or from the construction activity itself, which goes right up to the property line. And as the uh, as the applicant has stated, his intent to shave the tree's branches, 50%, as close to 50% of the tree's branches and roots uh, right up the uh, right up the tree, uh, creating a very unsafe condition. Um, and whether so whether you know what protections there are, uh, whether the setback is protected against that kind of construction activity. Um, so that's kind of one A and one B. I don't know if you want to address you know address those or just let me continue with a couple of other points directed to uh, you know on matters of bylaw. Um, so the yeah, so the I guess I'll address these to Mr. Champ, but just uh, briefly. Um, so I think the, f it was your first question in regards to the. The burial of the wall. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, okay. we, yeah. So I th think Mr. Champ has addressed that prior, but I will ask him again. So the, the, when we are discussing the setback from the property line and it is a retaining wall where the abutting property is higher than the subject property um you had said that the you consider the the face or, or the the point at which the setback begins as the exposed face of the wall and the same would hold if the subject property was higher that it would be the face of the wall and it basically means that it's not the portion of the wall that is in that is underground is not the where the structure is considered to begin it's the portion that is exposed that's correct that's how it's always been interpreted for walls uh the the purpose of the setback is for you know what you can actually see if it's underground you, you 
you don't even see it. And I believe there's an illustration in one of the uh, plan sets that shows uh, that, you know, in fact, that the majority of the wall is underground and that there is not a uh, as large of an area of wall that um, that is visible once the, once the ground is when you know once the area is graded. Okay. Thank you. Um, and I just then... want to point out that if he's so close to the property line and not meeting the existing grade exactly, mm -hmm. uh, I think there's some conflicts there where it's not clear how it's going to be resolved without some kind of regrading happening on our property. And that's is happening because of how close to the property line right. this project is. No, and I, I think Mr. Tampa had noted earlier that sort of these, the portion of the um, sort of that interface between the, the property, at the between the two properties and any impact that the construction on one side has on the other side is something that um, is a civil matter to be addressed between the two parties and is not um, something that is necessarily addressed in the permit itself. I understand that there there are some minor grade changes. The blocks are of a specific size, and so they do create uh, places where the it doesn't exactly follow the grade. Um, so, um, but Mr. Matthews, I think you had another, you had said you had another question. Yeah, so the other question is about um, the, you know, listening to that prior um, docket, Mm -hmm. was a reminder that the special permit uh, hearings, uh, yeah, that yeah. one of the criteria for, for judging on a special permit is, you know, that the purpose and the intent of the bylaw is that there is no impact on, um, on other residents of the area. Um, and since we've all agreed, uh, even the uh, applicant has agreed that there will be an impact on mm -hmm. our, uh, on us, I'm curious how we resolve this kind of matter of civil use kind of this the civil matter that you described and then this issue that you know is uh, it can be taken under consideration by this by this board right so um obviously this is not a special permit uh this is a standard permit um and so the criteria that we judge a special permit by are not the same that a standard permit is judged by um the zoning bylaw does not say that the work on one property can have no impact on another. It's that it can't be substantially more detrimental than the existing condition. Um, that is, that's the usual standard that we we are required to apply. And so, um, the way that it's written, it, it it deals with the the physical portion that's being built. So, if it was before the board, well, I, I can't speculate because it's not before us in that manner. We're not looking at a special permit right now. We're just reviewing a special permit that's a, that is in place. I mean, excuse me, a standard permit that's in place. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. I, I think that it's it's helpful to step back a second because we don't have jurisdiction through special permits or any other thing uh, just because something has an adverse effect on somebody's property. It it doesn't work that way. If there's this, every time that we have a special permit, it's because there's some specific provision of the zoning bylaw that authorized that prevents somebody from doing something unless we give them a special permit. And the very first thing you do when you fill out that form is point out which provision of the zoning bylaw it is. It's frequently a some it's just a note in the dimensional table. Sometimes it's something specific like the the long provision that authorizes uh, ADUs or the provision that offer, authorizes large, um, requires a special permit for large additions. But you never start with saying there'll be a bad consequence and then say, infer from that there must be a special permit. The town meeting has to do that, and they have done that in a number of cases. And there are certainly plenty of bad things that can happen without ever invoking uh, a provision of the bylaw that allows for a special permit. Uh, once you have a special permit, once this by zoning bylaw authorizes and requires a special permit, 
then you apply the conditions we talked about in the last case, and we would consider, among other things, the, uh, the whether something is is harmonious or consistent with the neighborhood. Um, but you never do that unless you start with a provision of the bylaw that authorizes the granting of a special permit. And then when you do do that, you look at the provisions of the bylaw that relate specifically to that kind of permit. Um, and one of the difficulties we have right now, if, if in fact this required a special permit, this would be a wholly different case. But the permit that's actually before us is not a special permit and not something that, as far as the record shows, a special permit application is authorized for. It's just a disagreement with the decision of the building inspector. And there you have to just show not even not even we don't even have jurisdiction over a decision of the building inspector that may violate the building code. It has to specifically violate a provision of the zoning bylaw. And that's, you know, I about 25 or 30 minutes ago raised that point and I raised it again that that until there's an argument that's that says, here it is, here's a provision of the zoning bylaw. This is what the decision of the building inspector uh, ignored or or uh, violated. And this is the and this is what should happen by it. Uh, then we don't have the ability to, to step in. And when you say it's a civil matter, since I, unlike all the architects who understand all this other business and the engineers, I'm the lawyer and understand a little bit about what civil litigation is, because I did civil litigation for the 30 years. Those are the lawsuits that you already have some, nobody ever has a good experience with a lawsuit, but uh, you, you already have some, that's, that's where potential settlements come in. That's where you deal with the law that, that affects the rights of property owners. Uh, if if the property owner next to you trespasses on your property, there are a lot of rules about that. And your lawyers have probably told you quite a bit about what those rules are. And that's a whole process that is designed to deal with disputes between neighbors that are like this. We're just enforcing a, a zoning bylaw. And the zoning bylaw doesn't cover the whole world. And it's often very technical. And there's a lot of things that you wish you would be able to do that you can't do. But that if you're a judge, since I spent all this time as a lawyer and not a judge, I can say with some assurance that judges are practically superhuman in their compassion and intelligence and always get it right, except when they don't. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Um, so, uh, you know, we've been at this for quite a while. Um, we've heard a lot from um, both the the uh, the prop the property owner who applied for the permit, um, and for the abutting property owner, we've heard from the public. Um, would like to try to um, bring this to a conclusion. So, I see that the Mr. Downhauser, uh, excuse me, Mr. Downhauser has his hand up. Um, if I yes. could ask you to make a but for a statement, and I'll ask the Matthews to to touch again on the zoning question that they had, um, and then we'll try to wrap this up. Sure, I'll make it very fast. Um, regarding the the lawsuit, the pretrial, the judge just um, you know he basically said that I have the right to cut back any roots and branches across the property line in order to put the wall in properly. So he guided us in that direction, and he was actually surprised that the lawsuit was even there because he said, "Of course, this is Massachusetts law; you have that right." Regarding the parking area increasing in size, um, if you take a look at Exhibit E, you can see a bunch of photos and basically it shows the width of the driveway, the current driveway. And it's just, unfortunately, it's just, believe me, I, I wish there was room to make the parking area bigger, but there is not one inch to make this parking area bigger. Our cars would not be able to come down the driveway. It just would not be possible. To, not only to drive in the driveway, but also to pull into the parking spots. There's 14 spots back there. And then the last point I want to make is you know, the contractor that I'm working with, we are happy to do any rating issues that you have on your property. If for some reason the property line, you know, gets affected a little bit where it, it, you're not happy with the way it's graded and you want to grade it higher or whatever, we're happy to work with you um, to, to make, you know, you're satisfied so that you, you know, we, we want to try to put it, the wall back exactly where it is to make the grade exactly the same. And so if you want something a little higher or lower in one area, we're totally willing to work with you to do that. I mean, if you, as long as you authorize us to, you know, come on your property to do that. We're happy to do that. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Denhauer. Um, 
Mr. Matthews, I think you said you had a zoning, a couple of zoning points you still want wish to make. I just want to point out that, you know, the zoning bylaw 6.1.11.d1, we were thinking about the wall. I'm an architect. Mm -hmm. I do zoning plans all the time, and it's usually the exterior face of the wall that must that is relevant to setbacks. Um, I did look for clarity in the building department. Are we talking about the, you know, which face of the wall needs to fit within the setback? I didn't get that clarity at the time, which is why we brought this to you. So I, I the intent was not to waste anybody's time. And because there are so many neighbors here who um, we know and appreciate, we just want to point out that we are not suing Mr. Dowenhauer. He is suing us. Um, and we've really done nothing but try to enjoy our yard. We agree um, with Anna Tustison that the the wall is in desperate need of repair. And if it's in such desperate need as Mr. Chiampa said, I would expect Mr. Dowenhauer to be buttressing it immediately if it could collapse during this meeting. Um, and his what we've heard most recently is stance is he's going to cut the roots of the 80 foot tree up to the property line which will just create an even more dangerous situation so thank you for letting me stay my piece absolutely thank you very much um so returning to the board uh so um as mr hanlon had laid out um at the start the question before the board is whether um, the, build, the building permit that was issued violates any terms of the zoning bylaw um, and that the board that uh, the board would cause the board to ask the uh, or to um, rescind the issuance of the permit and would like to hear from board members with their opinion on that. Um, no, I mean, going from from my my sense of it, I, I just I don't want to color everyone else's opinion. Um, from what we've what we've heard tonight. Uh, both from both the appellant, the applicant, and from uh, Mr. Champa, is that the permit was issued uh, for a new retaining wall that is a that's a thicker retaining wall. It's a more hopefully a much more stable retaining wall to be installed in a fashion that does not, which does neither decrease the area of the driveway. Um, and parking area for the, the apartment building, nor does it um, increase it. And it doesn't, so it does not, the face of the wall that is exposed is not being uh, moved in the direction of the, the property line. Um, and those being the case, um, while the there are definitely going to be impacts on the adjacent property due to this change, um, and due to the replacement of this wall, I don't see anything in the zoning bylaw that would say that this permit was issued um, in error or issued in a fashion that is not conforming with the zoning bylaw. Mr. DuPont, did you have... Oh. You know, I've been really struggling through this whole thing because I do understand, uh, I think, both sides, at least part of it. I mean, I do, in having looked at the wall, I mean, it certainly looks like it's a fairly urgent matter to me. And I think it needs to be dealt with fairly quickly. I don't know. I mean, the the part of it that I think I have focused on is the idea as to whether or not the proposal in terms of what is going to be constructed is um, structurally and in engineering terms appropriate 
And I think that it most likely is based upon the fact that Mr. Champa has issued a permit. And so it strikes me that that's sort of the most important part of this, at least in my analysis and deciding whether or not the the permit was issued in error. If somebody said to me, well, here's another way that you can do this that is equally as sound and will be just as supportive and won't extend as far as it is proposed to do and, you know, and, and all of that. I mean, I'm not even sure we'd be able to decide that the permit was in error under those circumstances. Okay. I haven't seen anything along those lines as sympathetic as I am to the idea of the tree. And um, so I just... I'm, I can't find myself that there was any defect in the issuance of the permit. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Mr. Chair, if, if I could go next. Yes, Mr. Mercadelli, yeah. To, to build off what Mr. DuPont said, you know, I think um, from, my, from my view of it, uh, maybe in, in agreement with everyone who's spoken, uh, uh, you know, I think the the um, the permit was issued in accordance with our bylaws and uh, for an unsafe condition that needs to be remedied. I I certainly wish you know uh, I'm very symp sympathetic to the neighbors and I certainly think that there would be maybe less disruptive ways to fix this wall, but that wasn't the um, the task in front of Mr. Champa. So I don't think that we can, we can, we are the ones to uh, make that decision. So um, as, as Mr. Hanlon noted previously, there's, there's a whole infrastructure around um, those, those decisions that would not be zoning related, but more uh, legal in nature. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, I agree with both Mr. DuPont and Mr. Rigardelli. I'd just like to stress it in the in the example where someone had a brilliant new way of dealing with this to make it all work better, to accommodate the interest better, to save the tree, to to handle the parking lot in a way that that you had a, a win-win situation. Um, I still wouldn't overrule Mr. Champa. Because I'm not in a position to make that decision. I don't have the legal authority to make it, and I don't have the expertise to make it. What I would do is what every good lawyer does, and I would kick the can down the road and seek a continuance and ask Mr. Champa to think about it. And if Mr. Champa came back and said, you know, that's a damn good idea. That's what we should do. That would be the way the, the, the matter gets done. Uh, but, you know, it it's not necessarily true that every wrong has a remedy. And if... If it may very well be that there's nothing better that can be done, it may be that there is something better and Mr. Champa didn't see it or it wasn't presented adequately or whatever. Uh, but Mr. Champa, it's 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 up to Mr. Champa to make that decision. It's still up to Mr. Champa to make that decision if he thought that there was something better to do. Uh, we We don't have the legal authority to do that and half of us don't have the practical expertise to do it either. So uh we just have to rely on the expert in our government who's entrusted to do this and i have a great deal of confidence in him and i'm not in a position to overrule him thank you mr hanlon um so with at this stage it does not look like um the board would be um in, in favor of overturning the decision of the inspector um so I think at this time, it would be time for the board to go ahead and close the public hearing on this docket and prepare a decision. Um, the chair would ask the uh, Mr. Hanlon if he would be willing to prepare a decision uh, recommending a, a denial of the request to um, do it. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, I'm always willing to do these things. I do I actually have two other decisions that are pending. Yep. And if somebody were more willing than I, I'd be perfectly willing to defer to them. 
Okay. Well, I will be perfectly happy to twist some arms on your behalf uh, after the meeting. We could ask Mr. Champa to do it. <laughs> um, so the chair will accept a motion to close the public hearing for docket 3813-928 Massachusetts Avenue. Mr. Chairman, so moved. Thank you. And a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. So roll call vote of the board. This is a vote to close the public hearing for docket 3813-928 Massachusetts Avenue. Please respond yes or no, Mr. DuPont. Yes. Mr. Hanlon? Yes. Mr. Holly? Yes. Mr. Riccadelli? Yes. And the chair, uh, Mr. LeBlanc, excuse me. Yes. And the chair votes yes. This one is also closed. Um, so I appreciate everyone's coming out this evening. I understand this is a very, um, a very difficult matter and one that does not have any easy solutions. Um, I appreciate you bringing it to the board um, and we will have a, a written decision to, that we'll be voting on at our October 8th hearing. We thank the board and Mr. Chavo for their time. Absolutely. Thank you. So that is the end of our public hearing. So we now go thank back you. to the administrative items that are on our agenda. Um, these relate to final votes and applications before the board and operation of the board and as such will generally be conducted without input from the general public. Board will not take up new business on prior hearings, nor will be the introduction of any new information on matters previously brought before the board. Um, so, first of these um, is docket 3812, 15 Merrigan Street, uh, which had requested a special permit under section 539A. Uh, Mr. Hanlon prepared a decision that was circulated to the board for questions and comment. Final version posted the this afternoon, are there any additional questions or comments in regards to the decision for Merrigan Street? Seeing none, uh, the chair moves that the Zoning Board of Appeals for the Town of Arlington approve and adopt the written decision for Docket 3812-15 Merrigan Street, which grants a special permit under Section 539A in the Zoning Bylaw. Second. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. So vote of the board. Um, and in the, uh, so there were four uh, mem full members of the board who were present at the prior hearing. Um, Mr. LeBlanc also sat in on that hearing. So I will ask Mr. LeBlanc for his vote. Uh, so vote yes or no, Mr. DuPont. Yes. Mr. Hanlon? Yes. Mr. Rigadelli? Yes. Mr. LeBlanc? Yes. The chair votes yes, that is approved. Uh, next up is uh, the decision for docket 3815, 32 Princeton Road, which grants a special permit under 539D in the zoning bylaw. Uh, this was heard at our September 10th hearing, um, had a, a decision prepared by Mr. Hanlon, circulated to the board for questions and comments, final version posted again to the board this afternoon. Are there any additional questions or comments in regards to the written decision for 32 Princeton Road? Seeing none, the chair moves that the Zoning Board of Appeals for the Town of Arlington approve and adopt the written decision for in docket 3815, 32 Princeton Road, which grants a special permit under section 539D in the zoning bylaw. Second. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. It's a roll call vote of the board. Um, as in the prior, uh, Mr. LeBlanc having sat in on the prior hearing, uh, he will be our fifth vote this evening. Voting yes or no, Mr. DuPont. And yes. Mr. Hanlon? Yes. Rigardelli? Yes. Mr. LeBlanc? Yes. And the chair votes yes. Uh, so that is approved. That brings us to the de written decision for docket 3818 20, uh, 37 Fountain Road, which granted a special permit under section 5102B1. Um, this was heard at our September 10th hearing. Uh, we had a decision prepared by Mr. Hanlon circulated to the board for questions and comments. Uh, final version posted this afternoon. Are there any additional questions or comments in regards to the written decision for docket 3818 37 Fountain Road? Seeing none, uh, the chair moves that the Zoning Board of Appeals for the Town of Arlington approve and adopt the written decision for docket 3818 37 Fountain Road, which grants a special permit under section 5102B1 in the zoning bylaw. Second. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. So roll call vote of the board. 
um, and as in the prior two, uh, Mr. LeBlanc will be voting. Um, so please vote yes or no. Mr. DuPont? Yes. Mr. Hanlon? Yes. Mr. Riccardelli? Yes. Mr. LeBlanc? Yes. And the chair votes yes. That is approved. Uh, that brings us to uh, the next items. The next four items are all uh, sets of minutes. Uh, the minutes were submitted to the board uh, several weeks ago, um, seeking questions or comment. Um, are there any additional questions? Or, so um, yeah, we should vote on these independently because each have different people who are there. Uh, so in regards to the minutes for July 9th, are there any additional questions or comments from the board? Seeing none, the chair moves that the board approve the minutes for the July 9, 2024 meeting of the board. Second. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Um, and then voting members of the board, uh, vote yes or no, Mr. DuPont? Yeah, yes. Hanlon? Yes. Mr. Holly? Yes. Mr. Gidelli? Yes. Chair votes yes. That is approved. Uh, next are the minutes for the July 23rd, 2024 meeting of the board. Are there any additional questions or comments on those minutes? Seeing none, the chair moves to approve the minutes for the July 23rd, 2024 meeting of the board. Second. 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 Uh, vote of the so roll call vote of the board. Voting yes or no, Mr. DuPont? Yes. Mr. Hanlon? Yes. Mr. Holly? Yes. Mr. Riccadelli? Yes. The chair votes yes. Those are approved. Uh, motion to, uh, it brings us to the minutes for August 13th. Are there any additional questions or comments in regards to the minutes for our August 13th, 2024 meeting? Hmm. Seeing none, the chair moves to approve the minutes for the August 13th, 2024 meeting of the board. Second. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Roll call vote of the board, Mr. Hanlon. Yes. Mr. Holly? Yes. Mr. Gardelli? Yes. Mr. LeBlanc? Yes. And the chair votes yes. Those are approved. Uh, then we have the minutes for our August 27th, 2024 meeting. Are there any additional questions or comments in regards to those minutes? Seeing none, the chair moves to approve the minutes for the August 27th, 2024 meeting of the board. Second. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon's roll call vote of the board. Mr. Hanlon? Yes. Mr. Holly? Yes. Mr. LeBlanc? Yes. And the chair votes yes. Those are approved. All right. Those were all of our administrative items. Um, then we have, uh, so our next meeting is October 8th. Um, Ms. Ralston, I think October 8th is a fairly light week. Is that correct? Yeah, we have no hearings. Um, I think we're just going to do the zoning documents that you were, we reviewed in September. Okay. okay. So we'll be reviewing the bylaws, uh, proposed changes, to, uh, not bylaws, the rules and regs, um, considering changes to that, and also uh, looking again at the online application um, and how we might improve that. So that's the plan for the October 8th. We'll also be voting on the three decisions from this evening. Um, are there any additional matters before the board this evening? No. Seeing none, I will just ask Mr. Moore if he's okay. I see his he has a bandage. Just want to make sure he's all right. I'm not sure that's new business, but definitely yeah. it's uh, a, an interesting matter in my life. Uh, yeah, I'm okay. I'm being treated yeah. for something that's always stored in my life. Well, we wish you your best. But thank you for thank you for asking. <laughs> Good luck. All right. Well, thank you all for your participation in tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I appreciate everyone's patience throughout the meeting. I'd especially like to thank Colleen Ralston, Mike Champa, Mike Cunningham, and Jacqueline Munson for their assistance in preparing for and hosting this online meeting. Please note that the purpose of the board's recording the meeting is to ensure the creation of an accurate record of its proceedings. It's our understanding the recording made by ACMI will be available on demand at ACMI. TV within the coming days. If anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email to zba at town.arlington.ma.us. That email address is also listed on the Zoning Board of Appeals website. And to conclude tonight's meeting, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. So, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Second. 
Thank you, Mr. DuPont. It's a vote of the board to adjourn. Mr. DuPont. Yes. Mr. Hanlon? Yes. Mr. Holly? Yes. Mr. Riccadelli? Yes. Mr. LeBlanc? Yes. Chair votes yes. The board is adjourned. Thank you all so very, very much for time this evening. And we'll see you in uh, on the 8th. Good night, everyone. Good night, everybody. Everybody. Good night. ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help.